That's a fun fact. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, or they put us in the bad place. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. I'm so happy. We watched the best movie. Oh, we did. It's so good. We did. We'll get there in a second, though. Unfortunately, Eli did not watch it with us, but we're happy to welcome back a veteran guest masochist in his stead. Michael Marshall is the host of Be Reasonable, the co-host of Skeptics with a K, the project director for the Good Thinking Society, the editor for Skeptics Magazine UK, and also one of the organizers of QED, the single best conference in all of skepticism, which is coming back to Manchester in October and includes a live gam record. Check the show notes for more information. Marsh, welcome back. Guys, you are welcome for this film. Uh, and you know what? <laughs> I needed this film. The last time we went to record, I didn't appear on the show because I had several catastrophes happen at once. I needed the catharsis of watching this film and then being able to talk about this film with you guys. That's fair. That's fair. This was delightful. All right. So we've teased it quite a bit, but I'll ask you now. Tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Knowing. It's the story of... Nicholas Cage being an astrophysics professor at MIT mm -hmm. and God having to genocide the entire planet in response to that. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Cage as an astrophysicist was the least believable part of this film. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at that point, the genocide seems like a reasonable reaction. So, yeah, yeah, if we've got to that point, we probably should start over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Marsh. How I I feel like I'm using the wrong wording here, but it is sort of the format. How bad was this movie? Well, if you love disaster movies like Don't Look Up, but you feel that like the real disaster was that the scientists failed to accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, <laughs> you will love this movie. Yeah, no, it becomes a Christian film eventually. Trust us. Now, Marsh, this was your suggestion, as as we already alluded to. So do you mind telling the audience why you decided to inflict this one on us? Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. So I was so excited for you guys to see this film. I watched this film kind of earlier on in the pandemic. And at the time, I was like, oh, God, I have to do this film. And then I completely forgot why I'd recommended it or even that I'd recommended it. So when Eli mentioned last week and Marsh has especially recommended this one, I was like, have I? And I got into watching. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because <laughs> this film has no idea what it's meant to be. Yes. But I honestly think it they may have inadvertently made the perfect GAM film because it's a numerology film. It's a global disaster film. It's a spooky strangers film. It's a creepy kids have got sort of magic powers film. And then all of that isn't enough. So they end by doing a really hard turn into very heavy religion. Yeah. And it's like, I in my head, the director in the editing suite had like a gam-worthy question mark dial in the, in the edit. <laughs> and he's like, no, I just have to keep edging it up a little bit while like in his mind maintaining full eye contact with you both. Like you fuckers are going to review this movie. Clearly. Yeah. So, okay. So is there anything you want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, and we've already touched on it. It's best worst astrophysicists. There you go. We've got Nicholas Cage, the astrophysicist. <laughs> we've got his friend, the astrophysicist. And they're at MIT. They're doing astrophysics. Something freaky is happening with the sun in a day's time, and they haven't noticed it. At no point have they noticed that the sun <laughs> is going really fucking weird. They're just astrophysicists yeah. looking at the st looking at the stars, looking at the sun, and not noticing what's going on. We were looking the other direction from it. It was not okay. Sorry. Very clearly they were. And then you know, Nicholas Cage. We talked about numerology. He's presented with a string of numbers. He figures out some of those numbers are dates, and some of those numbers are a specific detail about an event that happened in a specific place. But he can't figure out what the other numbers may be. And as an astrophysicist, <laughs> coordinates don't come into his mind as a yes. possibility. Yes. <laughs> well, they're telling us when a thing happened and what happened. I wonder what other information they could be yes, trying to convey. Where, where, is there a how? Is there a numerical how? So, and, and what's amazing to me is that it's not just that there's this disaster that's going to happen with the sun. It's that there's already shit happening with the sun. Yeah. It's been happening for weeks. Right. They, they keep alluding to, yeah, that electronics are going out and it's way hotter than it should be. So, and you would think that the astrophysicist, you know, wouldn't have time for hobbies at the moment. But no, <laughs> they don't even see it coming. So I was and we've already alluded to this one as well. I'm going to go with best worst surprise Christianity. Mm -hmm. Right. Because 
it like it's like the, the movie is surprised that it's Christian. It's like every time that the <laughs> Christian shit comes up, the whole movie stops. It looks to the left of the camera and it goes right. Oh, right, the gam dial with the question mark. Forgot. <laughs> Sorry, forgot. Let's go to eleven. Nice. We're going all the way. Yeah. So I was gonna go with best worst rocks. Okay. <laughs> they okay. They have rocks. They're sure the movie is mm. certain that there's something with these little black rocks and they're going to be like an omen and then a thing and then a Chekhov's rock gun, but <laughs> nothing happens. No. It's the, it's, they're, they're trying so hard throughout the movie. You can see the movie like, yes, ending itself and like, yes, hey, yup. And this rock will show up here and then it's totally going to, going to, going to tie in. No, it's not going to tie in. Nothing. No, and they also seem to think that the rocks are going to be spooky, mm. right? Like that you're going to see the rocks and you're going to go, ooh, rocks. Did this come out like right after the Blair Witch Project maybe when they were like, I know sticks worked. Maybe rocks would also scare people. It's like it's like seven or eight years after that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I have a theory. I think in the script, rocks was just written as a placeholder. There you go. But, right, we're going to we're going to do a thing here. So let's put rocks for now. We'll come back to it. And then they never did. Oh, uh, look, I found another lorem ipsum. This is so weird. <laughs> Holy shit. This is an omen. <laughs> but as omens go, it's just really silly because they have to give each other rocks. Like the, the, we'll talk about it. There is someone giving someone a rock as if it's ominous, but it's just like, oh, it, it's like, here's a shiny pebble I found. Like, like you're, it really like you're exchanging with an eight-year-old who's just yes. showing you their favorite rocks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. There is Nick fucking cage on the other side of this break. So we're going to do you the favor of keeping it brief. But when we come back, we'll dive into all the ignorance that is knowing. So what do you think? Now you need more shoe polish, right? Like mine. Oh, okay. okay. Got it. I'll add some more. Uh, hey, guys, what are you doing? Oh, uh, we're getting our teeth ready for QED this year. We want to fit in when we go to England. So we thought we'd maybe um. What, wait a minute. Did... Are you are you about to frame the entire quip ad around the tired and offensive stereotype about British people having bad teeth? Uh, no. Also, what? also no. Wouldn't it just be easier to tell our listeners that good health starts with good habits, and that's why Quip makes it easy by delivering all the oral care essentials that you need to care for your mouth? Well, that's true. The Quip Electric Toothbrush is loved by over 7 million mouths and has timed sonic vibrations with 30-second pulses to guide a dentist-recommended two-minute clean, as well as a lightweight and sleek design with no wires or bulky charger to weigh you down. Plus, you get a multi-use travel cover that doubles as a mirror mount for less clutter. It's perfect for traveling to England for QED, for example. Right, and that's why we were we were talking about getting ready for QED. Yep, that's it ties it in. Sure is, the, it's the travel cover. Yep. Okay, yeah, the, the cover, right. Mm -hmm. Well, now Quip offers more than just the brush. They've got everything you need to build a complete routine, including anti-cavity toothpaste in mint and watermelon that helps prevent cavities and refillable sugar-free gum that has a long-lasting mint flavor and comes with a dispenser. All right, Marsh, we're sold. How do we sign up? Just go to getquip.com slash awful right now and you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash awful, spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash awful. Quip, the good habits company. Okay, but, but, but British people do have funky teeth though, right? No, you're from Georgia. Okay, withdrawn. You had to get dentures at 45 years old? I said withdrawn. All right, guys, welcome to the very first writer's room meeting for the new Nick Cage movie, Knowing. Ooh, ooh, hoorah. Hoorah. Now, all right, so we've already gotten a basic outline to work from from visionary director Alex Proyas. It's about what he wants to do with this film. So, uh, Theo, can you read that for us? Okay, yeah, sure. So he's got uh, yada, 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 plane crash, yada, 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 subway derailment, yada, 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 city blowing up. Oh, is is that all? Uh, well, at the bottom, he's doodled a duck with an excessively large penis, but I'm guessing that's unrelated. Yeah, no, he does that a lot with memos, too. Okay, so I guess all we need then is a protagonist, an antagonist, a plot, uh, some exposition and inciting incidents, some rising action, a climax, some falling action, and a resolution. So, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, let's, let's just start at the top. Shout out ideas if you have them. Nick Cage's character is uh, a physicist, a professor, an atheist, a, an idiot. Ex idiot. Excellent. Excellent. An idiotic atheist physics professor. Perfect. OK. OK. And the antagonists are uh, aliens, aliens, uh, demons, stalkers. They stalk angels, creepy whispers. They do that. Yes. Excellent. So demonic aliens that stalk people with creepy whispers and turn out to be 
angels. Hey, uh, Dave. Uh, yes, Sam. Okay, I, I feel like maybe we should just, you know, pick one idea sometimes, just the one. Yeah, we don't always have to use all the ideas. What? Uh, s- sorry, guys. Uh, I was just doing a little thing called teamwork. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, yeah, I just feel like good writers make choices, you know. Okay, okay. Uh, but answer me this then. Which movie tends to be better? One with one single writing credit or one with seven? Um, exactly. Now, uh, sh- just shout it out. Who's got some exposition? Oh, uh, his wife died in a hotel fire. Uh, he's estranged from his dad. He lost his faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, a little girl wrote out a mysterious code 50 years ago and stuck it in a time capsule. Yeah. This movie's going to be awesome. And we're back for the breakdown. We're going to open things up in 1959 at the opening of a new elementary school. And I think this is the least effort I've ever seen to make something look like it's the 50s. This is just, we've got a few <laughs> costumes. It'll be fine. Yeah. It's the hair thing. The, the 50s was all hair. Nothing else matters. You don't have to do any other work in, this, in, the, in the scene. We got poodle skirts and train hobos and <laughs> hair 50s done. Yeah. And sepia filter. Yep. That's it. (laughs) And this is where we're going to meet Lucinda, who is a little kid at the school who's staring directly into the sun. Yeah. Like fucking Donald Trump checking out an eclipse. Yeah, I assume she was just trying to make herself live forever, reverse aging. We've been down this road. (laughs) Not have to eat. Yeah. Can you eat it? Can you eat the sun? Uh, You can, as it turns out. So, yeah. and, And she's hearing... The whispery demon voices that have been in every horror or pseudo horror film for the last 27 fucking years. (laughs) Right. Yeah, that's got to be obnoxious. She looks she's terrifying. Like my note was she will murder me. Is she standing right behind me right now? (laughs) But like, I get it. If I had to deal with these like demon whispers or whatever's happening all the time. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd murder people. Right. Right. So, okay. So but they call them into class. We go into the classroom and it turns out that Lucinda has won the best idea of how to celebrate the opening of our new school competition. Her idea was with a time capsule. And this is where the teacher does this kind of exposition dump by asking kind of questions to the class. Like, yes, miss. It's like, so she's saying things like, uh, so we're doing a time capsule. And like one of the kids puts his hand up and says, what's a time capsule? And I think a more pertinent question is, why a time capsule? Come on, they're shit. Nobody wants a time capsule. They're not fun to put in. They're not fun to take out. <laughs> they're rubbish. Do something else. They're sure that it is fascinating to watch a cylinder be pulled up in the air from lower. in Yeah. On, like, uh, and to be pushed down into the ground from the air. Yeah, right. Both ends of this. The, this movie is pretty sure are really exciting. So, yeah, but the assignment is that each of the kids is going to draw a picture of what they think the future will look like in 50 years. But Lucinda instead does just a big, long list of numbers. Right. Yeah. If I was drawing the future, I think I'd put like an ocean that's on fire and that's it. Like just a (laughs) picture of that. I don't know. Yeah, you would have you don't want. I've got to say as well, draw a thing that a stranger might possibly look at in five decades is a really low pitch for excitement for these kids. I don't think I'd be that bothered by that. Yeah. You draw a thing, someone might look at it in half a <laughs> century. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But the kids are all in. They are orgasming all over this fucking room when she announces it. <laughs> yeah, but so Lucinda's writing her code down. This is important. The teacher takes it away from her like too early. Lucinda's clearly still writing stuff. So the magic code she's got going is going to be missing stuff and that's a it's a big deal yep in there yep very important I think plot no yeah no this is that's very it's going to come up later so then we we cut to the thing the, the like ceremony where they're burying the time capsule with much pomp and much circumstance but lucinda is standing way over in the on the edge of the crowd being creepy with her single balloon <laughs> And they gave her that, they gave all the kids balloons just so they could get her holding a single balloon <laughs> looking like it's it. That's what that was. Yes. It's just ripping off it. That's exactly it. Yep. How do you not look over at her and be like, hey, Lucinda, you clearly know about some evil magic thing that's happening. Like Are you, you wrote doing that code some... and now you're staring at me. You're holding one balloon like the, in the Stephen King. I know what you're doing. You have to tell us. <laughs> you see, you seem to be involved in some kind of exposition here. Could you just yeah. like, like just lay it out for us? <laughs> So, yeah, but then we see her balloon floating away because she's suddenly gone missing. So we have like the cops and the teachers all looking for her in the school. Nobody thinks to turn on the fucking lights. 
Well, this is it because the ceremony <laughs> took place in the middle of the day. Right? Yes. In bright sunshine. And that, that, and that's when she went missing. But it was dark by the time the police were starting to check inside the school for her. And I was like, who are these? The Uvalde Police Department. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So they walk through this dark ass school with no lights on and just flashlights looking for this little girl. And ultimately, the teacher finds her in this closet where she has scratched to the remaining numbers. Remember, she wasn't quite done with her code. She scratched the remaining numbers into the door with her fingers. Ooh. It's like eight <laughs> digits. So the, the teacher took the paper off her, didn't take the pen off her. Wouldn't she just use the pen to write the eight digits on the desk? You'd be like, okay, that's done now. But she waited the entire day to find somewhere she could scratch it on a door. Ludicrous decision making, Lucinda. Have a just think, think for a moment. So <laughs> all day she was like nine eight five three seven two. Nine. <laughs> yeah, nine, right. Nine, I she slightly <laughs> forgot it. <laughs> oh, is that a? Four? I'm gonna scratch this with blood into fuck, a fuck, something in the basement later. Let me write it on my hand now. <laughs> fuck! Don't talk to me. Nine eight seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, but then we get the credits proper. As we pan over Earth, I love that the, these movies always do this. It's like, we're not going to recognize that planet if they don't show us the U.S. first, right? Yeah, it could be anywhere. It could be absolutely <laughs> anywhere. And as we're panning as well, we don't actually pan and slowly and like zoom in. We just kind of cut in by a couple of order, a couple of levels of magnification, but not actually that much magnification. So we don't really get much closer with each cut. And it just feels a bit like they were waiting for the software to load the closer image each time. Like it's a really <laughs> slow software. Like, oh, come on, man. I just want to <laughs> zoom in and see my house. It's a, I just want to see what my house looks like from space. I don't have to wait 20 minutes for each of these frames to load. <laughs> so yeah, this is where the most depressing aspect of the movie comes up. This was Alex Proyas. Mm. Guys, that's the, that's the director that did The Crow and Dark City. And this pretty much just ended his career, this movie here. So, yeah, but eventually we zoom all the way in on Nick Cage looking through his backyard telescope because he's an astrophysicist. You know, obviously they. <laughs> Sorry, just <laughs> saying that out loud. Nick Cage is an astrophysicist. OK, not just any astrophysicist. MIT. MI fucking T. MIT. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. And his kid, his, his kid <laughs> comes and he's like, hey, dad, has anyone found life on alien planets? And I'm like. Why don't you just have a mask if there's going to be aliens in this movie? <laughs> right. And, and what his kid comes into is like, is this a midnight barbecue? So it sure looks like one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely it's dark. He's cooking sausages. It's their traditional midnight barbecue. Yep. Yeah. Because, no, it's pitch fucking dark out. Well, they're in Boston and it's supposed to be October. So it gets dark pretty early there. But yeah. Yeah, and Marsh, you're being very generous. These are not sausages. These are shitty hot dogs. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's because this is a classic hot dog time. Why yeah. did he leave that yeah. pause in that sentence? He takes an entire <laughs> swig of wine and swallows between words of a sentence. Okay. Unbelievable decision. Cage was definitely improvising. He was like, this is hot dog. I got this. <laughs> sip of wine time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So yeah, so but we learned that first of all, we learned that his kid doesn't want his fucking hot dogs because he's a vegetarian now. That will never matter. And also, we learned that tomorrow is the day when they're going to open that time capsule from the exposition, right? And and then we also very quickly learn that the kid is mad that dad doesn't give his dead mom an imaginary afterlife because of his atheism. Yep, <laughs> dead mom check, <laughs> agnostic dad. Check. I told you this was perfect gun oh, and, and we barely drinking? got started. Yeah, dad's drinking constantly <laughs> yeah. because of his atheism. Yeah, no, uh-huh. All right. <laughs> so then we cut to MIT where Nick Cage is apparently a, <laughs> Yeah, right. Incredible. Uh, teaching incredible. other and and the and the discussion that they have them do in this MIT astrophysics class is so fucking silly. They're like Hey, would anyone like to define terms that Noah first learned in the seventh grade? <laughs> yeah, this, this class is very much welcome to everything the script writers knew about physics 101. <laughs> That's what this class is. Like, there is the, the board behind him, you know, they, they've seen differentiation online. They've seen the dy, dx kind of equation stuff. So they've got that on the, on the back wall, but they spell integrate wrong. It's oh, wow. E it's I N T E. R G R A T E. So wow. that makes me worry about Nicholas Cage's <laughs> right. physics expertise. <laughs> also, he's a professor of astrophysics assigning a term paper, like an essay, like a philosophy essay to an mm. astrophysics class about determinism versus randomness. Yes. That's what he's doing. Yeah. 
Right. And and in so doing, he's going to just he's going to toss a little model of the sun to one of his students and say, tell me some factoids about the sun. This is what they do in college. Right. Those fancy <laughs> colleges name sun stuff. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he and and he fucking Nick Cage's character refers to the sun as a celestial ball of fire. That is the first thing he says about astrophysics. And it's wrong. <laughs> right. So I just <laughs> well, he clearly just he, he announced at the beginning of the movie, I'm going to teach astrophysics slam poetry style. You guys deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's what he does. Everybody get up on the desks. Quick. Come on. <laughs> Ball, uh, fire. Celeste. It's so stupid. I like, he, he damn near starts because this is obviously they're trying to sneak the fine tuning argument into this to the beginning of this movie, like to the point where I was afraid he was going to start talking about a tornado in a junkyard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but of course he says, like he tells the kids that he thinks that everything is random and nothing matters. And then he just stares into the middle distance. Yeah. And how is this a physics lesson? He's just saying that you've either got <laughs> determinism or you've got randomness and, and nihilism. Anyway, kids, physics. See you next week. Right, yes. Now I know he thinks of physics. <laughs> right. One of the students is like, what are your religious beliefs, Nick Cage? And he says, I'm a depressed atheist class dismissed. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, and so all the kids are filing out. This is where Phil comes in. Phil is going to be the best friend character. He basically comes in and says, hey, man, I'm the best friend character. Should we be walking outdoors with coffee in the next scene? And Nick Cage is like, sure. Yeah, he plays the same role as uh, Truman's best friend in The Truman Show, who just comes yeah. in get, get, to, to move the scene along a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, so they're walking along. And the, Phil is trying to tell him to get back on that horse and start dating. He's like, man, come on. It's about time for you to get a love interest in this movie, no? But this is how badly this film is written. Because Nick Cage is saying, well, I can't, you know, I, I can't go out and date because I've got a son. And Phil's like, oh, yeah, because that time you're going to go on a date and your son had a cold. This other time you went on a date and your son fell over or something. You're too busy caring for your son to get laid. But then the very next thing is Nicolas Cage completely forgot about the really important <laughs> yes. event. in his yes. son's life. So which is it? Is he too caring for his son or is he the neglectful dad who's too into his work and drinking and mourning? Because you can't pick a lane movie. Right. No, you know what it is, is that this movie was written using like trope magnets on a refrigerator. Yes. Right. And they could only move the plot along if they could find another trope to do it with. Even what they decide to do just makes zero sense at all because we established that the class he was just giving was Monday morning because Phil came in and said, that's a bit heavy for Monday morning. So this event, this, this ceremony is happening on Monday morning. Nicholas Cage presumably drove his son to school for the ceremony, <laughs> dropped him off, drove to work, and then forgot about the reason he dropped his son at school. <laughs> so, okay. So we cut to the 50th anniversary of the school, the ceremony where they're going to get that two back out of the ground. <laughs> we have the teacher that was in the opening scene, but she's real super old now because it's 50 years later. And so, and then we watch the kids fucking overawed by that whole metal tube comes out of whole thing we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Everybody claps. Everybody goes nuts. like the like the old people at a movie theater being like, "Woo! Whoever made the movie probably isn't here, but woo." Yeah. yeah. Everybody there's clapping, but the music cue is incredibly sinister like, oh, "What if the 1950s gets out and escapes?" <laughs> <laughs> like it's the thing. But all of these kids are super excited because each one of them is going to get their own. Apparently, the number of students in this school has not changed a lick in the last 50 <laughs> years. They've had to keep it at exactly the same amount because each kid is going to get their own <laughs> picture of the future from a kid that was there 50 years ago. And they each get to open their own envelope. And this almost starts a riot. Yeah. All the kids are like, paper from 1959. Fucking give me right now. Murdering each other. Oh, yeah. No, it's like a fucking British football match. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost too, I'm almost too young for that joke. But <laughs> but yeah, but so, of course, Caleb, the Nick Cage's son, gets his picture. But he's also hearing demon voices through his hearing aid as this is like, but whisper monsters. Yeah, it's not totally clear that's what happens because you seem to get him like get a bit of feedback as he goes near the old lady. And I just thought it was like she's wearing a hearing aid and there's some sort of cross stream thing oh, going right. on and it's yeah. feeding back. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, just turn it, change to a different channel. It'll be OK. What really wasn't clear that was happening. Yeah, no, these notes are written with the benefit of hindsight, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he's hearing the whispering 
And then he looks out into the distance and there's like a creepy demon guy who's clearly doing the whispering, just standing there at the edge of the woods, <laughs> staring back at him. So, yeah, just to be clear, this creepy demon guy or whatever, the whisper guy just showed up entirely to stare at Caleb for like two seconds and then yeah. leave. And then disappear into the woods. Yeah. Okay. Two. Nailed it. Yeah. I'll see you later. <laughs> it's, a, it's like, it's a good thing he went to one of those very heavily forested parts of Boston to go to school because otherwise (laughs) like this guy needs woods to disappear and every time he appears it would be really awkward for him if he had been in Brooklyn right yeah oh you just seem like uh, running across the car lot like ah god the kids look back too quickly (laughs) ah damn it I I need to disappear but does anybody have a bus schedule because if I could disappear behind a bus (laughs) yeah just just ducking down behind a car's wheel (laughs) (laughs) he's trying to get Caleb's attention and Caleb won't pay attention to him he's like no I'm doing it Mm." Hey, it's Caleb, and just like <laughs> sirens are going past. Ah, okay. Caleb, Caleb, menace. Bye. Yeah, now, of course, Caleb, when he it's, it's his turn to get an envelope, of course, he gets Lucinda's page of insanity numbers. Why would they put that in? Right. You could choose not to put that in. It's a drawing. The kids are drawing things of the future. She's written down a load of really random. Just throw that away. It's fine. No one's going to care. Well, no, there has to be one for each kid. They, they, they've spent <laughs> right, a lot yeah. of time no, making sure the exact number of kids <laughs> from 1959 is the same. That is true. Well, I love that one kid comes up and he's just like, he sees Caleb's numbers and it's like Charlie Brown getting a rock for Halloween or whatever. He's like, ha, you got numbers because you suck. Because you yeah. suck. <laughs> the kid's like, numbers, boring. But to be fair, a badly drawn 50-year-old picture of a rocket is also pretty boring. <laughs> pretty so boring. there wasn't a high <laughs> threshold to aim for here. So, okay. So that night, Nick Cage is doing the dishes. Caleb has taken out his hearing aid because it's filled with demon whispers. <laughs> right? And this is also where, like, we, we have to learn... I, this makes no fucking sense to the plot, but the kid is like, hey, dad, can I go s- do a sleepover at my friend's house? And he's like, yeah, sure. He's like, they're going to go on a boat. And he's like, oh, I don't know about boats. That never comes back. No. And we all thought at this point that his mom drowned, right? It's yes. like, oh, no, you can't go near the water because of what happened. But she didn't drown. No. Nope. It's just like Nicolas Cage being a, a slightly overprotective dad, I guess. Like, oh, I don't know about that. Maybe next time. Right. It, it, it doesn't come back. Amazing. She died by the opposite of drowning. Yeah. Yeah. So, if anything, he should be encouraging the kid onto the boat. Right. died in a fire. <laughs> yeah, go, go on the boat. You won't burn to death there. Water's the opposite of fire. <laughs> Is that bad or good? <laughs> so, so, yeah. But of course, as they're doing that, Caleb is trying to decode that number page. And Nick Cage is like, you're supposed to leave that with the school. That belongs to the school. And I'm like, I think they they can do without this crazy lady number page, man. I don't think any like the, no, nobody's cataloging that. They're, <laughs> they're going to throw it away. But it also suggests that Nicolas Cage saw the page full of crazy numbers earlier and was like, oh, OK, cool. K- yeah, you got, yeah, right. nice. you, nice. you, you got Yeah, right. You got the one with the numbers on it. <laughs> I did that when I was eight. Yeah. <laughs> And now at 55. Yeah, no, because I'm an astrophysicist. That's what we do. So, okay, so the kid goes to bed. Nick Cage goes downstairs to drink himself into oblivion er, right? <laughs> but this is one of the places where they get pouring whiskey <laughs> wrong. True do. Because pa- first of all, he pours basically half a pint of whiskey, yes, which is not yes. how you drink whiskey. He <laughs> takes a single sip of it and then tops it back up. <laughs> this is not how heavy, it's not about how much you put in the glass. It's about how much from the glass goes into you typically <laughs> when it comes to heavy drinking. <laughs> Oh, he's got a he's he's filled that glass really high. He's yeah, really oh, drunk. he's going with a works. big gulp of yeah, right. He grabs a bendy straw, it pokes him in the <laughs> eye. Like everything's going wrong here. And I thought yeah, maybe he doesn't really like the taste, but he just really enjoys pouring. He finds it quite therapeutic. <laughs> but we find out he doesn't even really do pouring well because we cut away for a second and he's just overfilled the whiskey glass until it's completely overflowing out of his glass. <laughs> Is that a thing that happens where you start pouring shit and you look away from the thing you're pouring? Who the fuck? does that i guess eli probably does that only nicholas, nicholas cage. cage in real okay, life yeah. they kept the tape okay no that's i fair. don't think that nicholas cage is allowed large containers of liquid because he will do that to whatever receptacle is nearby <laughs> what movie was it that we watched where he was drinking like skittles or something that, that this is starting to all make sense yeah <laughs> so I, I wanted him to like lean down to the coffee table and slurp the top of the whiskey or whatever off but until it was, <laughs> that's real that is how it yeah goes. no okay so <laughs> yeah you don't waste it 
Right, but he goes into the to the kitchen to clean up from over pouring his whiskey, and that's where he notices something interesting about those numbers on the number page. It's so stupid. He puts the whiskey down, and it's still a little bit wet on the bottom of the glass, and that ring because he puts it down on the paper with yes, the code. Uh huh. That ring circles some of the numbers. Yeah, and so he looks at that, and he's like, "All right, you know what? I'm gonna." I'm going to figure out this code. I'm going to start with this part. It says 91101-2996. But that's not even the first part that he circled with the whiskey ring. No. And he didn't even circle the nine at the front of that. I thought he notices 911. I thought he's like, hang on. This this circle that I've randomly put down whiskey is is has pointed to 911. Okay. Huh, well, that's got to mean something. <laughs> He should he should have noticed that, but he just notices the numbers. He writes them down and he's like, what is 911 <laughs> and then another number? What if, is it 91 slash 10 slash 1? Yeah, he does. He no. does. And I was does. like, it's clearly 911. What are you doing? Oh, my God. And also, Hurry up. right. So it turns out it's it's the date and the number of people who died at 911. And, and of course, the movies are like, wow, what are the odds? And I'm like. What are the odds that on an entire piece of paper covered in numbers, some significant series of seven digits would show up when there was no preordained pattern for them to follow? <laughs> it's, that's absolutely guaranteed. Your yeah. phone number for when you were a kid is going to be on there somewhere, probably. Whatever. It says to be or not to be here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, but of course, it's a fucking movie. So he immediately starts ripping things off of his walls and, you know, swiping tables clean and shit so that he can figure this shit out. It escalates very quickly from him being like, I wonder what these numbers are. 9-11, this is definitely a prophecy from 1959 with a demon or something. I'm figuring this out. He's tearing stuff off walls. And he's writing all these numbers on a whiteboard. He has a computer. He does. He is going to use the computer to look at what yes, the numbers on the whiteboard right. are. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Okay. He finally figures out maybe it's 09 slash 11 slash 01. And then he Googles what is 911. Well, so <laughs> he's the, the remaining numbers, the, the next four are the number of people who died in 911. It's like 2960 or whatever. And so he's got to Google that and figure that number out. But then it's like, well, if, if you didn't realize that, why did you pick specifically that number of digits even? Why did yeah. you just pick seven digits if you didn't see anything there? But what he's finding out is as he looks at these numbers, he realizes that all of the big disasters are in there along with the, like, the date that they happened and the number of people who died at them. And, and this, again, there's so much of this, this that does not make any sense and could not possibly make sense. So you, you know, you, you've got the date. You've got the number of dead people. You've got then a string of numbers he can't identify what they are. So how does he know where to stop that bit to move on to the next dead? That could go on right. a lot longer. But he also, we see him go through this montage of more and more different dead, like uh, mass death events. But he's starting from the start of the numbers. And he, he manages to get through like, you know, 15, 20, however many, he's just going through all of them. And so after you've done the first 10, mate, Find today's date. Find, <laughs> skip. Skip the middle bit. We, like, we know, we don't need to know what happened in the 80s and 90s. You've got the pattern established. You're a fucking scientist. You don't have to do he every does, one of these numbers. Just go through every single yeah. goddamn one. He doesn't get to the end. He, 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 it's later in the film he gets to the end of the string of numbers. Yeah. Just find today, find, find last week and move forward from that. Right. Jesus. Okay. If one of those was wrong in that 50 year span, he would have been like, oh no, it's nothing. Oh, this never, mind. never mind. Never mind. Never uh, mind. Okay. The, the, the first 47 almost had me convinced, but yeah. Yeah, but no. this one's out by one death. So yes. throw yeah. the whole thing away. <laughs> scrub the whiteboard. <laughs> scrub the paper. Up. That's why it was on a whiteboard and not. A computer. Also, how do you think this code decided on like what counts as a big enough mass death event to be in the code? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, we, we start going through some specific ones later and that question really burns into your brain. Do you think it's like, do you have to die at the spot at the time? Or can it be like, if you died months and months later of your injuries, would that get added? Right, or would that right. get added at a later date? Is that what, like one later? Right. Like what about the first responders that died of the like 9-11 lung or whatever? Are they on that list? Probably not. God, that so, would be yeah. rough if they were on that list. Oh, yeah. Just a series of ones like four years <laughs> later or something. Oh, Jesus, man. Lucinda just walks back in and scratches a couple numbers <laughs> and starts <laughs> adding them. <laughs> yeah. So no, that, that really comes up in the next scene, right? Because he goes to talk to his buddy, Phil, to show him the the discovery 
And he's like, look, my, the hotel fire my wife died in was on the list. And that's like 46 people, 48 people or something yeah. that died in that. It's like 40. Is this every single time any group of more than 40 people have died over the 50 years? Because that's got to be a much bigger list. And I'm, I'm guessing we'll later find out that uh, a lot of those extra numbers are coordinates. I'm guessing most of those coordinates are in the Northern Hemisphere. I bet there's not a lot of developing <laughs> world coordinates on there for this list. I'm just saying the aliens are racist. Lucinda doesn't care about black people. That's what I'm saying. I think you're right. I think you're right. But Paul doesn't even make it on yet. <laughs> I love the exchange here. He's like, hey, man, maybe somebody's doing, I don't know, like a mentalism magic trick on you or something like that. And then Cage, also an astrophysics professor, is like, there was a sealed envelope. It's not a <laughs> mentalism magic trick. There was a sealed right, envelope yes. from the yeah, time capsule. Yeah. We never That's real. touched the deck after I shuffled We've it. We've never met each other before. <laughs> yeah. It's even worse than that. Because what he says is, you know, like it couldn't be a trick. I saw them dig it up. It's like, follow that through, Nicholas Cage. I saw them <laughs> dig it up. And then they handed that sealed envelope to my kid, who then ran away and opened it by himself on a park bench while I was talking to somebody else not looking at him. <laughs> it couldn't possibly have been tampered with. <laughs> chain of custody like fucking LAPD over there. Right. Yeah. yeah. They, but this had been buried underneath a manhole cover for 50 years and manhole covers are impossible for anybody to ever are impenetrable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but Phil doesn't believe him. So he's like, I'm, I, I'm taking my inciting incident and going home. <laughs> or actually, no, he, instead of going home, he goes to the apartment of the old teacher lady that was at the original time capsule burial to ask her about this long string of numbers, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they ask her, oh, do you remember Lucinda? And I really wanted her to, this sweet old lady, to break out some like offensively anachronistic terms for what they thought was wrong with Lucinda at the time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, I remember. I remember Lucinda. She was cuckoo bananas, don't you know? Just yeah. fucking nuts. <laughs> the doctors were completely sure she was suffering from a wandering womb. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so she, but he goes to Granny's house and uh, he's like, hey, you know, do you have the next plot point uh, <laughs> for me? And she's like, you know, the odds against me having it are overwhelming. But in fact, I do. I remember that day exactly. I just saw it in the exposition. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, is this the code that Lucinda was writing? Like. It's just a fuckload of numbers. What do you expect her to say? Oh, that's it. No, wait, wait. That's not it. I think that right there was a one. Right. In so this is someone else's <laughs> crazy script. Yeah, right. But of course, unfortunately, Lucinda is dead. So she, he, that's a, that's a dead end for him. He can't go talk to her. Right. Instead, though, he calls, he wants to talk to the janitors that pulled the time capsule out to see if one of them's a birthday magician or something. <laughs> and while he's doing that, creepy whisper guy from the forest earlier shows up in front of his house in a black sedan and starts talking to his kid, right? Or whisper thinking to his kid. Whisper thinking. And then he's like, here, have this small black rock. Yeah. <laughs> okay, bye. And that's the whole thing. Here's this lovely pebble that I found. See you later. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so weird. This is where we introduce the special black rocks that this movie is pretty sure are fucking creepy. Yeah, th this this movie is pretty is is pretty much hoping will play out without them doing anything. If you keep <laughs> putting in there, the rocks are going to do some stuff, right? They will not. <laughs> so I like I like to think of the scriptwriters watching along with us, hoping that the rock right any minute now the rocks are going to do something. It's going to be so cool. <laughs> so yeah, so Nick Cage is is he runs the people off, but he he doesn't catch them. They drive off too quickly. Is it, is this also where the kid says to Nick Cage? Dad, why are you acting so awkwardly? It's like, mate, this is Nicholas Cage. Yeah, right. That's not this a question you get to ask him. <laughs> Only mode he's got. <laughs> this is also where we, we speed introduce his sister, Grace, who comes in and says, Hi, Nicholas Cage. I'm your sister. You don't talk to our pastor dad anymore. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm your sister. I'm here to help your, my agnostic brother. And my name is. Grace. Grace is going to try and yep. be the, mm -hmm. the savior of this agnostic brother. Grace is going to be the savior. Just dial up that gam fodder dial <laughs> a little bit more. But yeah, no, but their dad is a pastor and Nick hates God and religion. And she even says like, she's like, oh, what's your problem? I'll pray for you. I'll help if with my prayers mm. if I can. And he's like, you can't because it's fucking stupid. Yeah, it's so good. It's, I'll say a prayer for you. And he's like, please 
don't. So yeah, I hear that, Nick. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm on your page there. Right. All right. So that night, Nick is drinking himself into oblivion once more because of the atheist nihilism. And he's watching the news hoping for 81 dead people, right? Because the code says that 81 people are going to die in a disaster that day. So it turns midnight and he's like, all right, let's switch the news on and see how good this list is, right? <laughs> okay. This was actually <laughs> funny. So like there was an oil rig fire on the news at this point and, and the guy like the guy in the news guy builds it up and then he's like, yeah, so there's a burst out and a big fire, but everybody got evacuated. <laughs> You watch Cage be like, ah, oh, damn, fuck, scratches it okay, off. I know. really, I really thought that was gonna confirm my theory. No, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> I wanted the news to keep pump faking like that for a while, but no, they just do it the one time. That, yeah. yeah, I want there to be another, another disaster, and they're like, and so far the death toll is eighteen. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's below the forty-eight threshold. That's Eight, not going to be on my piece of paper. Eighty-two. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We're getting it. A- no, yeah, eighty-two. It was eighty-two. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, but he falls asleep doing that. Apparently, he doesn't wake up until three in the afternoon when his son three is... Three in the afternoon? Yeah. Okay. I feel like you guys are being judgy about what that. What an insane detail to include in your movie. As far as I'm aware, he got drunk and so he slept for 15 hours. <laughs> so, well, I think he you just being watched... super judgy the, right now. Super judgy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the key, though, is that he's late to pick up Caleb. So, he has to drive out in a hurry. But, damn it, if there isn't traffic. Right? <laughs> so... He realizes that there's some kind of disaster going on in, in front of him. And and he's like, I wonder if 81 people. No. God, like, and, and that's when he notices on his GPS the latitude and longitude. And he realizes that, that it, the fucking numbers that are between the disasters are the coordinates of where the disasters happen. Okay. And he's an astrophysicist <laughs> and he never thought to check if the, the numbers that he couldn't identify were the no. latitude and longitude of the disasters he'd already looked up. Never considered coordinates might be what those are. Oh. Latitude. Apparently also all tragedies happen on exactly coordinates to the hundredth of a degree. <laughs> so like that's within a square kilometer. Yeah. At a point within a kilometer. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Seems like earthquakes would need a bunch of coordinates. You know, big floods, you would need a whole bunch of extra coordinates. Right, yeah, because like the tsunami was in there, was on the list. 9-11 was on the list and it happened in several different places. Yeah, you're right, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, but it gets even dumber because then it sh- he notices that this new disaster with the 81 deaths is right where he is. <laughs> Oh, I was so excited for you guys to watch this bit. And, <laughs> and uh, for no fucking, right, when he is there, right? Because we only have narrowed it down to a date. We don't know which day, like we, what time zone, or is it local time or is it Greenwich <laughs> Mean? Well, we don't know. It's kind of a dick move that Lucinda didn't write down the time of day. Like if you know the prophecy of death, you know, yeah. throw in better coordinates down to the thousandth maybe also if you yeah. can. And time of day would be great. Right. Just the hour, even the hour would be a great help. Because he stayed up watching TV for 15 hours. Right, yeah. Even if he said <laughs> about, about 4 p.m., he'd be like, oh, that's fine. I can get a normal so, yeah, night's sleep. Right. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but so Nick goes up to the disaster at the front and he's like, hey, man, did 81 people die here? And he's like, no, nobody nobody died. And he's like, damn. And the cop's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm doing a math thing. <laughs> but just then, <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's so great. A plane crashes into the spot where they are standing. <laughs> I wrote my notes. I love you too, this stupid piece of shit film. <laughs> it's so good. He gets hit by a CGI plane. Amazing. <laughs> so Nick runs towards the disaster because he's the protagonist. And just there's one flaming person after another, you know. Yeah. Okay, one great moment here. I laughed a lot. He's like, hey, guy on fire. Excuse me, sir. <laughs> yes. Guy on fire. I need yes. you to explain to me how many people were on the plane. And the guy, oh, he ran away. He ran away. He's, he's, away. And, and, he's on and fire. And Nick is like, away. this guy is so fucking rude. It's like, I can't even get his attention. <laughs> and you can you see Cage going through this terrible, tragic thing, counting people being like, okay, right. 80 people. Because he's not helping anybody. Like, 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 no. Normally in a movie, they would like give him some people to put out, but everybody's just dead or there's one lady yelling help me but she's just standing there there's nothing wrong with her and he's just I like feel like if i save a life oh go walk that way i might fuck it up right yeah fuck the I numbers i gotta get 81 exactly <laughs> or else my numbers thing is wrong i can't be the only one who 
could not stop laughing when a half dozen of people completely fine walked out the wreckage of the crash plane, sort of ran away from it, and then that wreckage exploded and killed them all in one go. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> the only one who laughed at that. <laughs> And Cage was like, oh, nice. I thought they were going to, that was going to yes. fuck up the 81. Okay. Yeah, like a strike. He was like, oh, that, that counts. That's like a split. <laughs> <laughs> and also, we should be clear, like, again, we, we he's an astrophysicist in this movie. He's not a first, resp- he doesn't know first aid clearly or anything like that. No. So he's just sightseeing. He's just <laughs> doing the count, Right. Yeah, I, I think I think this genuinely is the stupidest scene I've ever seen in any movie so far. And I think it gets topped later. It's yeah, so good. it sure <laughs> does. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Now this movie has earned the title of disaster film in both senses of that term. So we've earned ourselves a break. But we'll be back in a minute with even more knowing. Hey, Noah, what you doing? Oh, you know, with Eli gone, I've, I've got to write the bunch of the ads this week and i gotta say on top of all the other stuff i'm dealing with i'm starting to feel like i'm burning the candle at both ends yeah totally get it no totally get it sometimes life can be overwhelming and many people are burned out without even knowing it symptoms can include lack of motivation feeling helpless or trapped detachment fatigue and more oh yeah no i definitely have all of those symptoms especially the more sure well you know therapy can help a lot when you're feeling burned out huh So I thought therapy was like for crazy people and trophy wives. Nope, nope. Uh, Anybody can benefit from having a professional to talk to about the stresses in their lives. And that is why there's BetterHelp. What's BetterHelp? BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Huh. Is that all? That's not all, actually. I didn't I didn't think it would be. No, there is more. God Awful Movies listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash awful. That's betterhelp.com slash awful. Awesome. But do you think BetterHelp can help me write these ads? Um, probably not. But have you tried putting an ellipsis between the word what's and the name of the product or service? Like what's BetterHelp? Huh. You know, that that actually does the trick. That nails it. I guess I guess this is easier than Eli makes it look. Most things are. True. Hey, uh, you want to see me, God? Hey, Gabriel. Come on in. Have a seat. All right. So uh, what up, big guy? Okay. Well, you, you remember a couple of weeks ago when we talked about that project you were handling with those 30 Christian people in Oklahoma? Oh, yeah, yeah. The Mayflower 2 people. That's totally. the episode. Yeah. And, and, and you gave them a spaceship to spread the gospel. You brought back mm-hmm. slavery. Right. It was a lot. Mm-hmm. It was just, mm-hmm. uh, you, do you remember what I said about that? Yeah. 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 You said, keep it simple. Exactly. Uh, how did that go, by the way? Oh, they all died. Like, uh, like right away. There's nowhere near enough food. Yeah. So exactly. I, I, I'm reading the report about your new project. It says here that you had a little girl write down a prophecy code in 1959 and then put mm-hmm. that code in a time capsule. And then last week, a really bad physics professor got the code. Right. And while he's figuring it out very badly, you had a team of creepy guys yep. whisper stalk his eight year old son. Yeah, uh, that's all correct. Uh, I'm kind of building a moment. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It feels like a real bad moment. Sure. Yeah, I can see that. But what, what I really want to talk about is, is this code that you made. I, how, how does it work? Oh, yeah. This is cool. It's a string of numbers that represents all the mass death events in the world from 1959 until now. How, how many deaths is a mass death event? Uh, I did a cutoff at 47. That, that seems arbitrary. You, 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 so, moving past it. Why did you make a prophecy code of mass death events? Oh, it's to prove that your will, the will of God, determines every event. I, I, couldn't you have just done a list of, I don't know, like World Cup winners, you know, with the score of each game? I feel like it's more impactful with the mass death. Well, oh, so, oh, so, oh, all right, so just to be clear, you carried out a big list of mass death for the last 50 years just so it would fit the code? I did. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> no, I just heard it. I just heard it. You I see, see, there it, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. All right. I got it. I got it. I'll streamline the rest. Keep it simple. Great. Hey, Gabriel, your spaceship's here. Ah, oh, great. All right. I got to take off, God. I'll let you know how it goes. Bye. Save your receipts. 
he's he's gone. Space fuel is crazy expensive. Thanks, Biden. Right? Right? And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action with Nick Cage getting home that night. I guess Grace is with his kids and the news is on. They're talking about the plane crash. But (laughs) there's more than one. There were... This movie keeps always just adding one more <laughs> dumb fucking thing. Four different planes crashed that day for a total of 81 dead. No, I thought it was four, four crashed, but only one of them had any fatalities. And that was the one where Nicolas Cage was. I, I, I have no idea I like how they got to that number. But yeah. Yeah, but, not clear at all. <laughs> right. Either way, the code is real. And he <laughs> asks Aunt Grace, he's like, did you tell... Caleb, that I figured out a magical death prophecy because you probably shouldn't. She's like, no, I didn't tell. What What are you talking about? No, <laughs> I didn't tell your child you have a magical death prophecy. Well, it's it's even dumber than that, right? Because he hasn't told Grace about the death prophecy thing that he's got. He's saying you didn't tell him about the plane that crashed, did you? Now, keep in mind, when, when this kid called, Nick said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. So he lives within yeah. 10 minutes of the school. In Boston fucking traffic, right? So this is like three miles. This plane crashed between his house and his school, and you're not going to tell him about it? Yeah, it's Cambridge, not Boston. Okay. It's not quite as bad. <laughs> but also, when they when he walks in, Grace and the kid are watching the news about the crash. Well, the kid's not. Oh, is the kid? The not kid there? is upstairs. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Uh, he's not okay. allowed to apparently know about disaster stuff. I see, I see. Okay, I'll let them off on that particular one. The, the story holds up. The plot yeah, works. Yeah, no, it's right. Fine. Yeah, no, it makes perfect. Nick Cage could be an astrophysicist. 81 people so. died. It was in the code. The girl from 1959 was right. That's the point. Yeah, first estimate puts the dead at 81. Yeah. Whoever did that estimate. Nailed you know. it. <laughs> Fucking nailed it. Yeah. Great work. Right. So, but, but Caleb is sick and tired of being shut out of the plot. Damn it. But he'll go to bed because he's a kid in a movie. So he needs to get the fuck out of here for a minute. And then Phil pulls up, right? Phil, the friend astrophysicist, and he's like, you were right. 81 people did die today because of your magical death prophecy. Yeah. And at this point, Phil is totally on board now. This other astrophysics professor is yeah, on board now. And he's like, all right, let's do some death prophecy math. <laughs> and C- Cage, actually, this was a moment of good acting or something. He's like, I keep seeing their faces burning. <laughs> And Phil's like, oh, yeah, okay, this just happened. You were right Yeah, you there. did just walk <laughs> yeah, you, through 81 people dying of, and, and a dis- yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll give it a minute. We'll give it a minute. But the code we learn here has two disasters left in the future. Right. On the bottom of the page. Yeah, there's a great thing that Cage says here as well, because he says, you know, I, I keep thinking it must have been something to do with me because I drove past at exactly the right moment for that crash. Like, no, you didn't. You were stuck in traffic. You were there ages. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't drive right past. I know you're in shock, but come on. And it wasn't exactly there. Yeah, you were just within view of it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we know he, he's currently in shock right now. And we know that because he's drinking copious amounts of whiskey, but this time from the bottle and not from a half pint glass. That's oh, all you're spirit. right. So you're this is him in shock. Cutting out the middleman, yeah. So... Yeah, but he explains to Phil that they can stop the last two disasters. But Phil's like, you know, my scientific mind, he that's the term he uses, is <laughs> telling me not to have anything more to do with this. Because, again, <laughs> scientists hate proof that the entire nature of the universe needs to be updated. It's just like, you know, otherwise, you know, they might get remembered like fucking Newton or Einstein or something. And that would be embarrassing. Yeah. He's like, uh, th- my scientific mind tells me not to have anything to do with this experiment that would test your hypothesis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So that night, Caleb has a creepy, creepy de- dream. He dreams that he wakes up to creepy music and demon voices. And he sees creepy guy in the uh, out by the woods, but then suddenly creepy guy is in his room now. Yeah, which must mean he's got a really great pebble. Because you, if you're going to go through that amount of effort, <laughs> your pebble must be fantastic. <laughs> Very smooth, yeah. Caleb, Caleb, look, look. It looks kind of like a shark, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he walks into the room and, and like everything lights up orange behind him. Looks like something out of fucking Metropolis or something. The kid walks out uh, to the window and he looks out and there's a, the whole world is on fire out there, which would be a pretty impactful scene if we didn't then see fire moose. <laughs> the fire moose is so good. 
<laughs> it's so weird that every time anybody is on fire or will later be squished by a thing in this film, it tries to make it shocking and it just comes off as hilariously comic. Somehow, I don't know if fire could be slapstick, but they pull it off. They absolutely pull it off. <laughs> well, what, what happens is when you want to just show like a disaster that kills 81 people but remain PG-13, this is what you get. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you, he, he sees fire moose and then you're just like, okay, well, now you've made it silly. And then all kinds of other, like, fire fucking hawk flies by. All these animals are on fire and it's like, okay, well, now it's the fucking beginning of, of Lion King. Where are they going? It's all flaming. Cage just runs out there and he's like, excuse me, moose on fire, sir, <laughs> sir. <laughs> fire hawk, fire hawk. Ah, oh, they're all leaving. This whole scene is like if the fire in Bambi had won. That's what this film and this scene. Actually <laughs> oh yeah, is. okay, right. So yeah, so so Caleb uh, wakes up and he screams for dad. Dad runs up there and sees creepy edge of the wood guy near the edge of the wood where where you would see creepy edge of the woods guy. <laughs> and he runs out there. He's like he's like in his natural habitat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So Nick runs out there and he screams hey, but the guy doesn't stop despite having hey screamed at him. Fucking asshole. <laughs> this guy has a, a weird day. He just goes and yep. finds the edge and he does like a two second. Or maybe he has to wait for a while. I feel like he has to wait to get noticed. Probably, he yeah. Yell to them. <laughs> he's got to wait until the kid's done with his nightmare and everything. Yeah. Mm. You see him just unwrapping a power bar. Uh, well, but he okay, can't, it's, uh, menace, menace. Oh. But he can't do that. Yeah, right. He can't play Candy Crush or anything. He's got to be looking creepily at them when they, whenever they happen to look okay, that if way. They yeah. look over and he's just got Candy Crush or he's <laughs> taking a shit or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's all AirPods. He's just listening to audiobooks. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so okay. So the next day, Nick Cage. This is so fucking stupid. Nick Cage takes his son along for a bit of murder page mystery investigation. I guess they've closed school today because uh, a, an airplane damn near crashed into it, right? Yeah, and do you know how this, as far as I can tell, how he gets to this next bit of the plot is that Lucinda, the dead Lucinda, had the same name as a street that was in their town. So he drives to that street in order to find a person who looks a bit like Lucinda did in the picture of her that he saw in the paper, but like a bit less smooshed and dirt because she, this one isn't so crazy. Right. So he decides to follow this person who looks like a slightly cleaner version of the person who died in the 80s. I guess. That's how we get to this plot bit. This I, really so important plot bit. I assumed that he had Lucinda's address somehow, but yeah, they don't put that in your obituary. They don't put your street address in there generally. Yeah. She put the coordinates of her eventual daughter, <laughs> granddaughter's house oh, in the code, go. maybe? Okay, yeah. Well, that would narrow it down to an exact house. Sure. So yeah, and th so they just follow this this mother and daughter. I wanted so bad for them to be going on vacation, right? They're just <laughs> they get to Vermont or whatever. And they're like, you know, this is probably more than more trouble than it's worth. But no, they're going to the museum. So he goes with his son to the to the museum, and and basically he's like, hey Caleb, you go flirt with the daughter. I'll flirt with the mom. We'll see who has more luck, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> it's rough. It's rough. He goes over to the mom, and he's like. Hmm. Hello, is that your daughter? That's a really bad start. Don't <laughs> say that to people. What? It is really bad. Well, the, the daughter says to Caleb, she's like, did you know that all wolves are born deaf? And I'm like, stealing pickup lines from Heath. That's rude. Um, <laughs> fun fact, also blind. They're also born blind and deaf. That's a fun fact. There's a really great exchange between Nicholas Cage and the mother as well. Cause she's always, you know, the mother's like, Oh yes, my, my daughter's probably telling him about animals. My daughter loves animals. And Nicholas Cage responds by saying, yeah, my son loves extinct animals too. That, that's, that's not the same thing. <laughs> no. Oh so, yeah. My son is exactly the same. He loves dead animals. That's right, not wait, what, wait, wait, what? So hold on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and of course they, they, he, then they look over and uh, Caleb is teaching her to say stuff in sign language. Cause he's, he knows sign language cause he's hearing impaired. And so now they're all teamed up. The mother and the Nick Cage and the daughter and the son, they're all, they've all teamed up and they're going to go to the museum cafe together for, for a fucking milkshake or something. How is any of this? I don't understand. He's just, hello, is that your daughter? Sign language, extinct animals. We're on a team together for a mission. Like seconds <laughs> later. Yep. <laughs> That's all the care the fucking writers took with it, basically. Yeah. So they go to this, and, and I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and just guess, incredibly overpriced museum cafe. And they're they're having a chat, and suddenly Nick is like, "Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna just gonna, I'm gonna go full plot with you here. Was your mom psychic 
numerically speaking. Okay, but <laughs> the segue is insane. She explains that she had an abusive husband, which is also in, just out of nowhere. They just met. She's telling this really sad story, and he's like, oh, abusive husband. Is your mother a magical witch? With Speaking of which, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And she's like, dude, what? What? None of this makes sense in our lives. And he's like, well, here's my MIT badge. I'm <laughs> yes. That he gets out like he's in the fucking FBI. Right, he's right, like, uh, Nicholas Cage, MIT. You're under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> under space arrest. Yeah. Your mom is a witch. I'm, I'm a scientist from MIT. <laughs> I, I did math and she predicted all the medium and higher... Mass death since 1959. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. He's, yeah, he, he goes. So she's like, let me get my daughter and fuck off, which is the correct response. And he goes all the way Nick Cage on her. And I'm like, that's not going to help. No. <laughs> he chases her out to the goddamn parking lot yelling that, you know, 73 people are going to die in a disaster tomorrow because of your mom's prediction or something. Yeah. That'll matter. And she's like, yeah, cool. Have fun with that. Bye and leaves, which was the only reasonable thing she did in this whole scene. One of my favorite things watching watching a Nick Cage movie ever really is watching the other actors during Nick Cage's insane cadence of talking. Yeah, because they like it. It seems like he's finished saying something a lot, and they you can see him start to <laughs> say a line maybe, and then oh no, okay, oh well, no, nope. he's no, doing he's, his pump fake still... thing where he's he's doing slam poetry astrophysics. I should have seen that coming. Okay. He paused between hot dog and time again, didn't he? Yep, <laughs> sure did. Do you think he's on like a Zoom delay? You know, because there was a whole thing of like people recording <laughs> remotely, and you get that false start. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, I didn't nope, talk you, your you. turn. You go. You go. They're just doing that with Nicolas Cage all the time. If Nick Cage is buffering, that yeah, makes a yeah. lot of sense in real life. Is he? Oh, he's always buffering. That yeah, explains it's it. like Nick, Nick, Nick. Just um, just leave and then dial in, and we'll just get your audio <laughs> clean. It's, it's, it's fine. Nick, un it's unplug yourself for ten seconds, buddy. Plug yourself <laughs> back in. <laughs> <laughs> So then we, okay, so we get him, uh, this is so amazing. We get him at his house that night checking out his new gun, which, I shit you not, will never be fired in the film. No, and he's reading the instructions to his new gun, which I thought is weird, because I thought Americans were all born with innate knowledge of how to operate firearms. <laughs> I thought that was just in you in the same way that turtles know how to, like, make their way towards the sea. Right, yes. like, like Americans. Yeah. <laughs> Just a bunch of Republicans coming out of the water, finding guns on the shore like crabs. Yeah, that's a uh, what a terrifying sad, statement sad of America American that thing. this is. That is that like it is a f entirely realistic plot point that later in the day that he chased a woman out into a parking lot screaming about mass deaths that were on the horizon. He was able to go buy a handgun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. God. <laughs> so okay, so. He's he's reading the instructions on his new gun and in the background he's got the news on and the news is talking about a terrorist plot that this is the dumbest possible news broadcast. Basically the newscaster's like some large number of people somewhere tomorrow will die. Watch out. Anyway, good night. <laughs> That's so, the news. So Cage checks the coordinates for, you know, the tomorrow date on the code. And he's like, okay, got it. It's the corner of Lafayette and Worth in Lower Manhattan. That's got to be it. So his plan is to just like go to that place and vaguely stop a terrorist attack. Shoot at whatever comes. Yeah. The last thing was a plane crash. <laughs> right. So, right. Well, <laughs> catch it? Are you going to catch it if it's a plane? What the fuck are you talking about? Bounce it off? Well, his initial plan is to is to call in the terrorist attack to the police and say yeah. there's going to be a terrorist attack at this. But and he calls them in, and the police don't care at all. And I'm like Nick, you're not thinking. If you end that call by saying "Allo Akbar," yeah. they will have the entire police <laughs> force there ready to shoot to kill instantly. Also, the longitude and latitude would not get you the, the fucking cross street in Manhattan. Okay? No, you get you get a block, <laughs> a, a, a block of a square kilometer. Yeah, yeah right. So. All right, so he drops Caleb off with Grace because you can't have the kid along for the disaster part of the plot. How he does this is great. I have to say how he does this is oh, great. Yes. Earlier, Grace is like, oh, by the way, if you ever need me to look after Caleb, then I'm happy to do that. You know, a very kind, empathetic, sisterly kind of way of saying I'll look after your kid. Nicholas Cage arrives at the door and says, you said you'd take him off my hands. Yeah. It's like, he's right there. Right. You, say it a bit, <laughs> you said if I ever want to ditch the baggage sometime, I could just abandon <laughs> yeah. him here. So, you know, here I am. <laughs> 
I'm going to go hang out near a terrorist attack tomorrow. <laughs> yes. I don't know <laughs> exactly what I'm going to do. I brought a gun. Uh, you take my kid. I should be fine. He's right there. Yeah. So so he heads to New York City. We get a bunch of ominous New York City shots. Mm. Okay. He takes the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan. We watched that happen. Yes. Thank you. Why would that be? He <laughs> drove from Massachusetts. From, yes. He's coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> so he drove all the way down like 95 through Connecticut into New York. And then he went into Manhattan. Right. He and then happened. out to Queens yeah. and Brooklyn <laughs> for funsies. And then back into Manhattan. Or around through Jersey. Yeah, right. One or the That's other. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if that seems ridiculous enough, at times in some of the shots, the cars are driving on the left because many of these shots were were, uh, were filmed in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, were they really? <laughs> they didn't bother to oh, really? So, even yeah, that. yeah, I read on IMDb, there's loads of uh, cars driving on the wrong side of the, well, on the Australian side of the road. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Interesting. But this is ominous New York because every single person in all of these shots is wearing black. Do people wear other colors than black in New York? I'm pretty sure they did. Apparently when I was not in New York, in 2009. There was a different color. Not, not much. Yeah. Holy shit. It's like the fucking Matrix. It's a lot of black Matrix style, yeah. Like, I, I saw that in your notes and I'm just like, no, come on. And then I saw the scene and I'm like, a yellow shirt would have looked like a turd on a wedding cake in this fucking scene. Yeah, yeah. we just needed one woman walking down the street in a red dress. It's like, oh, okay, I see where we are yeah. now. Yeah. This is the Matrix. This makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and then it's, this is amazing. Nick Cage just walks up to some random street cop and says, why isn't this entire area closed off? I called from a payphone last night. I made a call. I'd mentioned Nostradamus and yesterday. <laughs> what, take it seriously. And she's like, cool. Show her your MIT ID again, man. Come on. <laughs> oh, no, that's awesome, sir. Let, just come right over here and we're going to talk about it. And then he runs away, which was very smart, actually, because he was about to be arrested for sure. Yeah, right, right. So he runs down into the, the subway station, right? So apparently he's decided that that's where the terrorist attack is going to happen. And, and and he looks around and he's like, oh, that guy's got a box. And I'm like, oh, yeah, dude with a package on the subway. Okay. <laughs> what could it be? <laughs> it's it's very much a game of uh, which sort of people is Nicolas Cage most prejudiced against. Yeah, right. That's yeah. what this is. <laughs> but to be clear, his plan was, all right, I'm in the subway. I'm going to make eye contact with people on the platform until somebody stares at me in, in a panicky way and then runs away. Yes. And then within seconds. Oh, there he is. He must have a bomb for 171 people. And he runs after the guy down the platform. Yeah, right. So we have a chase scene. The cops are chasing Nick Cage. Why would the cops chase Nick Cage? But they're chasing Nick Cage. Nick Cage is chasing some rando that, that ran away from him when he stared at him in a New York subway. Yeah. I mean, I've seen Nick Cage's stare. I would also run away. <laughs> you can't not land on eyes. It's like a thousand eyes all over the place. Yeah. Just everywhere you look. Right. So, yeah, but it turns out that that guy was just selling bootleg DVDs or something or stealing DVDs or something like that. Yeah. And and so it turns out he was wrong. That wasn't it. And then the train they're on derails. It, that was the disaster the whole time. Well, is the train coming the other way into the station? Yes. That derails. Well, right. Because the yeah. track switcher yeah. moves or whatever, and it mm -hmm. like it sweeps the leg of the train coming the other way. <laughs> it's going full speed into the station. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the train that they're on gets hit by the train that derails right beside them. Yes, or right behind them. And we have just another cavalcade of entirely comic deaths in what, what is meant to be a disaster film, what is meant to be scary. But every time someone gets even like touched by the train, they immediately smoosh. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, they're, again, they're trying to keep it PG-13, so we don't see anything graphic. They just disappear underneath it like the bad guy from Roger Rabbit, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, and there's a great moment when we're inside the train that Nicolas Cage was on, and the cop is still there with the shoplifter, and just as that train gets hit by the, the train, if you watch carefully the cop shoots the shoplifter. So like, oh. even in that crisis, <laughs> the police training just kicks right in to go for the, the minority who's done a misdemeanor, just really kicks right in. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and now this disaster is supposed to have 132 deaths. There's a point in this train crash scene where I'm like, are we watching all 132 deaths? If I count all the people that get smushed by this train, does it come to 132, like the end of Kill Bill? Or <laughs> I'd have watched this for an hour. I would have watched this scene for an hour. <laughs> And then they show the aftermath for a second and they're all, you know, just like walking out of the 
big explodey area in the subway because of the train that got derailed. And I'm such an asshole. All I thought was like, that's going to be the worst for the commuters above ground. In right? Yes. And the that's whole rest of the day. Well, you could tell we were we lived in fucking New York. Yeah. And also, <laughs> this is so stupid. In the big aftermath shot, we pan up to the American flag and just linger on it for a second as if to just say, huh? America. What a <laughs> what a disaster. I don't even know. what. Yeah. So, OK, so he goes to pick up his son and instead of driving home, he drives them to Diana. That's Lucinda's daughter that he that he followed to the museum earlier. The one that he stalked to the parking lot. No, no, that's their house. They're, She's yeah. waiting for them oh, outside oh. of his house. How the fuck would she know where he lives? Exactly. She doesn't. There's no way she could possibly know, but the movie doesn't remember that. Oh my so like, God. She's there. She's there. Shush, shush. Come on. Come on. Her grandma gave her a different sheet of paper that just had useful <laughs> coordinates for plot yeah. elements. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay. So she's showed up for his, I told you so. Gotcha. So, all right. This is where Diana tells him that her mom always told her that she was going to die on October 19th. And I feel like and uh, one time would be enough. You wouldn't have to always, <laughs> right? Like that. It's just like every day. Just, oh, God, mom, not again. <laughs> also, how does her mom know this? Because this is not a mass death event that's written on the piece of paper. So her mom was never told it by the whispering voices that gave her all those numbers. Right. So her, is her mom just guessing that? Well, so it turns out that, we, we, as we'll learn soon, that's when everybody who hasn't died in one of those other disasters dies, right? That's the the global apocalypse is on oh, 1019. I thought that was the next day. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. See, this story, it holds together. No, it it's, all it's, makes it's sense. really tight writing, Marsh. I feel well, like But nitpicky. here's the thing, though, is that how would she know that Diana wouldn't just die of leukemia before that or something? Like, right? <laughs> so you don't know she was going to make it that far. Because it says everybody else. And Diana's someone. Some, she is some, everybody, I guess, like, what are the odds that she would be on that plane specifically? Okay, so yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah makes, cool. that makes sense, yeah. So, and then Nick tells Diana his tragic backstory as well, right? He's like, oh, you know, my wife died in a hotel fire, and if I'd had this list back then, I would have known that there was going to be a terrible disaster in that spot, so she probably wouldn't have stayed there. Yeah, and then either the prophecy wouldn't have been right, or she'd have died anyway. Fair, yeah, well, right. Yeah. If if he like tried to do something about it, he would have killed somebody else. Yeah, like if, if the prophecy <laughs> true, is yeah. forty eight people die and he pulls her out, now somebody new dies. Right? No, you're right. It does kind of make you wonder why they would bury this fucking list, right? Because it doesn't. You don't need fifty years of correct predict. Like one, yeah, would have done it. Right. The, uh, that's what. That's exactly what happened. Us. Why did they bury this list? If this was a plan in order to tell people that there was going to be a mass extinction, why give it to a kid who was going to bury it? Why not give it to a kid who wasn't <laughs> involved coincidentally that day in a draw something on a piece of paper to bury for fifty years? <laughs> really, of all the people you could have given it to, she was probably the worst. Right. This was probably. Oh, I want to see this eight-year-old girl arguing with the whisper people. No, we just just give me like one day worth of important information that I wouldn't know, and I'll just. <laughs> I'll I'll give it to the newspaper right now. Yeah, you will we'll have it. There you go. Just like whisper people, just just give it to her the day after the time capsule, and it's fine. Just wait, right. to, wait, yeah, a few hours. Yeah. And when it comes to this kid, because they'll go back over the kind of the, the the kids' list of numbers again. The other thing I thought is whisper people teach this kid some kind of code structure. You know, put in a line break, a few punctuations. People would have known what it was. This is why we invented tabulation. Just pass on <laughs> the benefits of tabulation and everything would make sense. <laughs> List your columns, you know, <laughs> label your columns. Well, and so, okay. And then we get Nick driving with Diana and, and, and their kids into the woods in the middle of the night. And I'm like, all right, for all you know, he went to New York and killed all those people. <laughs> right like why would you go with him in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night like if somebody comes to me and says a, a stalker comes to me and says 132 people are going to die in the place I will be tomorrow and then that comes true I don't assume that he's psychic yeah you and your kid are now hanging out with the terrorist who derailed a train yes. and told you about it ahead of time and brought down a plane apparently yeah right yeah so right okay so, but then this is, of course, where Diana, she's looking at the list of numbers and she notices that what he seems to think is a 33 at the end is actually two backwards E's. Obviously, just look at the other threes. Those aren't threes. Those are back. It's ob whatever. Very, yeah. It's very obvious. Yeah. 
But all that means is on that day, the 19th of October, Emilio Estevez is going to die. <laughs> or Eric Estrada. So you're going to have to you know, try and narrow that down. That'll be fine. Yeah, just don't bother narrowing it down. Just let that happen. It's fine. Yeah, right, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be all right. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> so, okay. So, but eventually they happen upon this old creepy trailer. This is where Lucinda died, apparently, right? This is where she overdosed all those years ago. Diana says, you know, she willed me the property, but I've never done anything with it. And I'm like, wow, you'd think there would be property taxes or some kind of building requirements. <laughs> she says how this is driving distance from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And like within a couple hours. But no, apparently there's not. So they're wandering around with their flashlights, checking out the house. The kids are asleep in the truck, right? While they're doing this. And they come across her creepy disaster clippings wall. Yeah. I mean, why? Why would you have that? It seems like you could just have a folder if you're collecting yep. the newspaper clippings. I don't know why you need to put it up on the wall. But just more generally, do they think like they're they're searching this house for clues as if Lucinda, this magical prophecy girl from 1959, wrote down the last bit of the code that wasn't there and made it like a treasure hunt riddle for Nick Cage and Diana? Why would any of that happen? Well, yeah, I think that she is... wrote it on the on the back of the Declaration of Independence. That's <laughs> kids have to go and find it. I was going to say that is actually what happened, though. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is absolutely what happened. Everybody who's getting whisper people prophecies, just go ahead and tell us the whole thing, right? Yeah, right now. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And I love to so they're looking at the disaster wall, and they see a a picture out of her Bible. Right, this is a, a picture out of the Book of Ezekiel about the apocalypse, and they're like, "Oh, we should probably take this picture down. It's probably." important to the plot let's ignore all the rest of these but this one this one's got some plot significance yeah they have no basis on which to make that assumption nope. absolutely no because as far as they're concerned nothing about this is religious yet no right exactly so all right but as they're doing that the creepy guy from the edge of the woods shows up outside and he's got some friends he's got some creepy friends with him and they all surround the truck that caleb and the daughter are in yeah, I had these guys down as the Spikes from Buffy because they all look a little okay. bit like Spike from Buffy. Yep. So these are the Spikes. Oh, I have them as the Lost Boys. These, these are oh, the yeah, Lost yeah, Boys. Yeah. There you go. Sure. Fair, fair. So yeah, so while that's going on, we cut back inside. Diana and Nick Cage are about to leave. They, you know, they're like, oh, I guess there's nothing interesting to find in this trailer. What a weird scene. But then they notice a pile of those creepy rocks, just like the one that they gave Nick Cage's son sitting under the bed. Maybe there's something scratched into the underside of the bed, guys. Why? And, and there is, of course. It's the words everyone else over and over again. That's what EE -E stands for. So why, why, why scratch up the underside <laughs> of the bed? Know. Why scratch it more? Why not just write it down on a piece of paper somewhere <laughs> rather than or scratching just... it with your fingernails by the looks of things on the underside of the bed 15 times? I mean, you just paste shit on your walls anyway. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it, it's not like it was going to spoil the aesthetic. <laughs> Well, I mean, I would write on the walls, but I've got the room really set up just how I want to. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, so, it, so but, but then Caleb and the daughter are getting freaked out. So they hog the horn. They remember that cars have horns and Nick Cage runs out to see what's wrong. And he's like, the creepy whisper people are back. And he's like, you know what? I will run out to the edge of the woods where they hang out again. I bet this time I'll catch them. And he does. I like. I was he totally. Does. I was totally shocked. I, I was like. I, th I thought you had just Batman, but apparently he hasn't. Yeah, and he he, he tries his uh, his patented hay at the guy. Yeah, to try and get his attention. <laughs> right, and he gets his attention. <laughs> it does. It works. Third time's a charm. So so he turns around, and Nick Cage is like, "What the fuck is the plot of this movie? Damn it!" And the, instead of answering, the edge of the woods guy opens his mouth and a bright light comes out of his mouth and blinds Nick Cage. And then he Batmans proper. And Cage is like, okay, mouth light, that's not helpful as an answer. I don't <laughs> know what to I, do with that. I feel that. like you could have just disappeared all the way the first time. This was not a necessary thing. Was this like the men in black flashy thing, but with his mouth? Is that oh, okay. how this came across? Yeah, well, he's going to remember later, hmm. but yeah, no, that, that's <laughs> in the moment. Who the fuck knows? Well, I'll tell you what. Nick Cage's character just got blinded and I got jealous, so it's clearly time for another break, but first let me give Act 3 the hard sell here. Can this movie continue to get exponentially dumber with every reveal? 
Will Fire Moose get his own spinoff film? How long did it take us to realize that this and next were two different Nick Cage movies? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the apocalyptic conclusion of Knowing. Okay, and now you just throw all the food into the boiling water and then it cooks until all that pesky flavor is completely gone. Okay, got it. Hey, Heath. Hey, Marsh, what are you guys doing? Oh, hey, Noy. Yeah, I'm just teaching Heath how to prepare some traditional British cuisine. Oh, really? What's, what's the name of the dish that you guys are making? Meat boil. It's called meat boil. It is, yeah. What? Why don't you try HelloFresh? What's HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. But what if I'm going away this summer? Because I'm guessing they only deliver to your home address. Going away this summer? Just update your delivery address and enjoy HelloFresh at your vacation destination with just a click. Plans are flexible, so they work with your changing schedule. Oh, that's pretty convenient, but I'm guessing it's also pretty expensive, right? Actually, according to the Zagat Dining Surveys, HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining in a restaurant. It's even cheaper than grocery shopping. That's money back in your pocket, which is great if you're ever traveling abroad and your local currency recently lost a large amount of its buying power. Oh, good tip. This, this is fun. So are the recipes actually any good? They are, Marsh. One of my favorites is the pork sausage and bell pepper risotto with Parmesan and lemon. So good. Really good. That does sound really good. So so how do I sign up for this? Just go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful16 and use the code Awful16 to get up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. So you're saying I just go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful16 and I use the code Awful16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts? Exactly. Okay, fine. I'm in. Sounds great. But we might as well finish up the meat boil too. So okay. Keith, just go ahead and, and just really add the rest. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Ow! Ow, it's so much splashing. It's so hot. Lower it gently. Why is the cauldron so big? I told you the water is the key ingredient. Okay. <laughs> hey, God, uh, you wanted to do a follow-up on the death code thing I was doing? Yeah, yes. I, okay, so I, I'm reading the last report that you submitted. Just a reminder, the last time we talked, you said, I'm going to streamline the streamline rest. Streamline the rest, exactly. Keep it simple like you told me. Right. right. Yep. Right. Well, it says here that you had the team of stalker guys constantly whispering to the kid. Whispering. Yep. Right. But it doesn't say what they were whispering. Oh, good question. Yeah. Mostly nonsense at first. But then after that, well, well, well more nonsense for a while after that. Why? Actually. why? Uh, but then eventually some useful stuff about the big pl about the regular streamlined plan that we do. Oh, OK. Normal. You know this kid is hearing impaired, right? Like, it's, it's kind of fucked up to make him deal with whispering, too. Okay, yeah, but we gave him the hearing impairment using the whispering thing. They go together. That's It's helpful. No. What? No. that made, You made it worse. Did I? You see how that's worse, right? Okay. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Sorry. that That's on me again. I got it. Yeah. What, why oh, can't do that. Why can't they just, like, come up to him and talk, like, normally? Talk normally okay yeah no i'm writing that down Talk okay i just but i just said just don't add all these extra layers with kids getting tormented and mass death yeah i totally totally hear you okay no more extra stuff for no reason that's what you're saying i feel like that's what you're saying, right? exactly perfect okay uh hey gabriel there's a really big truckload of black rocks here for you all right thanks mike i'll see you later boss rock stuff i gotta do it right now bye is, uh, is, is the is the rock thing gonna pay off? Not at all. Oh, okay. You want a yogurt? Yes. And we're back for still more of this shit, and we're gonna rejoin our heroes with Nick Cage taking Diana back to his place to fill her in on the on the rest of the plot. Yeah, and I, I really love this bit because this is where Nick is saying, you know, I just know these guys have been following us for days, and she says. I think someone's been following me and Abby too. It's like, yeah, Nicolas Cage. We yeah, saw right. Him no, him. Him. <laughs> like, they definitely have been following me. him. <laughs> also, why would the magic prophecy guys, the lost, why would they be slow playing it like this over <laughs> right? days? Just c explain it. Stop doing weird whispers. Just explain the thing you want us to do if you're doing prophecy stuff. But they've been building up to this for more than 50 years. They, they've, they've had 50 years to make this a thing. Yeah, let them have this moment, yeah. Keith. It's, it's a lot of work that they've put in. <laughs> so, yeah. 
So yeah, so Diana's like, wait, are you telling me this is an apocalypse movie? And he's like, yeah, if you can believe it, I, they're in a religious one. It's all kinds of shit. I love it. At this point, I was like, okay, so the apocalypse is coming. So now Nick Cage has to like convert away from atheism in time as like an action thing. <laughs> and they kind of kind of do that, but not as much as I wanted them to do that. Yep, but that is going to be the plot of the third act yeah. of this film. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, so they learn that the apocalypse is coming in just a few days. And so that they go to like they they both go to they get their their kids in bed and they each go to their kids bed to sleep. And I'm like, I've seen kids beds. That wouldn't work. Also, I don't know why he goes to sleep in his kid's bed. He lets her have his bed, which makes sense. Sure. He goes to sleep in his kid's bed. We've seen him sleep on the couch. It's so comfortable. He can sleep there for 15 hours straight. <laughs> just just right? go back to the couch. Mate. It's fine. <laughs> Drink another pint of whatever, scotch and <laughs> olives. It doesn't matter where you sleep. You don't need right. a couch. Yeah, exactly. You're fine. But Caleb says, hey, dad, are we all going to die at the end of this movie? And Nick Cage says, I will never let you die. And Caleb says, I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's a thing <laughs> you can do. So, OK, so it's the next day. Nick is going to cook breakfast and he notices that Abby is coloring in that Ezekiel picture from the Bible that they took off of. Lucinda's wall earlier. <laughs> so stupid. Such a weird thing to be doing. Such a stupid way to advance the plot as well. It's like, oh, you've, you've colored in the sun. <gasps> the sun. That gives yes, me an idea. Right. To MIT. An astrophysicist. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute. The sun. <laughs> right. They're trying to figure out a way to get the astrophysicist to M at, at MIT to realize that at a time that's unusually hot and has too much electromagnetic activity, something might be going on with the sun. Yeah, yeah. he gets that out of a Bible. Page. The literal sun might as well walk into the frame and be like, "Excuse me, yes, I, I'm. It's me. I'm." Yeah, just, in this. just the sun appears. And, <clears throat> <clears throat> the sun's <clears throat> just standing at the edge of the woods. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> it's me. So yeah, so they go to um, they go to MIT to check on. The sun and Phil is there and he's like, man, am I even part of this fucking movie anymore? I feel like I've been <laughs> shut out of the plot altogether. But he's like, he's like, Phil, remember that paper I wrote on extrasolar activity? What if that's been the plot the whole time? So, yeah, you wrote the paper. You, <laughs> yeah. What, you remember, what if I wrote, you know, remember that paper that I wrote about the sun going crazy and wiping out all life on Earth? What if? The reason our life on Earth is starting to be wiped out is because of the sun going crazy like that. You, you did the research on this and what did you forget? Yeah. Well, and the, and I love this too. They're like, you know, oh, a super flare is going to hit the Earth and wipe out the ozone layer. It's like it would strip away the fucking atmosphere, right? Like there would be no <laughs> atmosphere. And they're going to fuck up what this would mean so bad with the, for, oh, the, for yeah. the remainder of this film. They're going to be like, oh, it'll be the radiation will go deep into the earth, a mile deep. And it's like, OK, so it'll be fine if it's night where you are. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking idiots. So but Nick angrily stares into the sun as though they're going to fight in the third act or something for a minute. <laughs> And that's when Diana walks in, as he said, and we're all going to die because of the solar flare. And then he looks and Diana's there. He's like, oh, shit, I was going to break it to you a different way. But now, you know. All right. Now we got to call the government so they can block the sun flare from hitting us or something like that. But that's it. But he says, how, you know, that's what one of the things Phil suggests. And Nicholas says, oh, they already know there's something up. But how do the they already know that something is going on that the astrophysics department of MIT right. hasn't spotted? Yes. These people are the worst physicists ever committed to film. <laughs> well, it gets even worse, right? Because she's like, well, what if we hid deep in some caves? And he's like, yeah, that might protect us from the total loss of atmosphere on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in this dumbass movie, he's like, yeah, maybe, maybe caves... No, but like act. a good cave. It's a really right. good cave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so so they get ready to go to the caves, right? They're all packing for cave refuge. Luckily, everybody has a pretty good idea what to pack. They're at his house. What the fuck are the mom and daughter packing? Anyway. <laughs> so, but of course, he looks at that unopened present one last time. It turns out that was the birthday present that his wife had bought for him two days before she died and but he and he's just never opened it in all these years i really wanted it to be something perishable 
Like she bought him some, like, some <laughs> really fancy kind of food stuffs, and it's like you know best before. It's, oh, oh, I could have had that. See, I wanted it to be something sexy, you know, it's just some <laughs> weird butt plug remote controlled yeah. thing or something. Yeah, right. Oh, it's that cock ring I always wanted. Right. Oh. Yeah, but it turns out it's a locket, and it's a this together forever locket with a picture of them. It's like. It's the kind of thing that a kid gets his mom on Mother's Day, right? It's a <laughs> shitty. If you like, if you think of it as a plot device, it's great. But if you think of it as the actual birthday present that a seemingly well-to-do wife got or seemingly well-to-do husband, it's pretty shitty. Yeah. <laughs> Is this glued to a popsicle stick? What? <laughs> <laughs> You're a grown-up. <laughs> so yeah. But they're about to leave, but he has to go outside and call his estranged pastor dad first, right? Yeah. Oh, we learn he tells he tells dad that like he has a prophecy the son's gonna murder us, so like get in the subway or a cave or something like that. But we also get the mention that that his wife, his dead wife, the hotel fire happened in Phoenix. Phoenix. Oh, I didn't know. Fire even think that reborn yeah. heaven. It's a Christian movie now. Yeah. yeah. In your face. <laughs> well, I mean, he's literally referencing First Corinthians twelve in this scene, so I don't think we have to go that far to call it a Christian movie. <laughs> but but yeah, he's but he's like, but dad, the world's gonna end tomorrow. Get deep underground and maybe you'll survive the loss of atmosphere. Yeah, that the whole lack of atmosphere in Rosalind, that's probably just gonna work itself out overnight. So just, right, just yeah, exactly. So just bring a day's worth of food and something warm. Yeah, something to read. You don't want to get bored. Yeah. Right. But dad's just like, nah, I'm good. Uh, I'm I'm a good Christian, so you know, whenever my time comes, I'll be all set forever. What about you? Oh, he's gone. The phone cut off. <laughs> well, so and this is a trope that I absolutely love. It's so fucking silly, right? When he's like, "Oh, I'm I'm a Christian, so I'm ready to go whenever the good Lord calls me." And I'm like, "Weird that you wait for the walk light, then, isn't it? <laughs> right? Just give me a fucking break. That's so stupid." That's a good. It's a, that's why you guys never take up any room in the hospitals and stuff. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, it's time to go, damn it. They need to get this plot on the road. So, and now, oh, he goes in to get Caleb. Caleb is writing scary numbers too. And he snatches it out of his hand and stops him doing it. Yep. Why would you do that? You know these are prophecies. Why right. would you stop him prophesizing? <laughs> that could have been something really, really useful about the solution to save humanity. Yeah, it, it, for all we know it is because this never comes up again. Nope. Right? So they leave, but instead of going to the caves to survive the loss of atmosphere, instead they go to Caleb's elementary school because the teacher lady told Nicolas Cage when she talked to him that Lucinda had scratched numbers into the door of that closet that he found her in. And he figures that, you know, 50 years on, those are probably still there. Oh, yeah, same doll. And, and you see him break into the school. Then I wrote, you know what? Elementary schools really are too dangerously easy to break into. Ted Cruz is right about everything. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, yeah, so he smashes. And also, it's like he's like, okay, now I just need to look for the one closet in the school. <laughs> and, and look, this would, it, it would be dumb enough if he like, had to look at a bunch of closets and, and find the one that has numbers on it. But the numbers aren't even visible. So he just takes the door off of a closet <laughs> and brings it home to peel all the paint off of it <laughs> brings it home with them so they would like what they cut out the part of the movie where he tried the first nine closet doors on that fucking school i, I also love that he brings it home and when they get out of the car she asks him why are we back here so yeah did he drive back in silence? Like, she's been in the car with him the entire time. He's like, shh, 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 you'll, you'll know when we get home. I'll tell you when we get home. It's a 10-minute drive. We know it's a 10-minute drive. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so Diana is, is like, okay, so I'm going to take my kid and fuck off while you mm. peel paint off of a door. Also, I'm going to take your kid and fuck off, which is yeah, a weird decision. Too, that, point, yeah. that was a weird, yeah, that was a weird addition to that whole bit. Yeah. So yeah, so she grabs the kids and takes the fuck off while he's still looking at the uh, door. He doesn't notice them leaving, but he finds some coordinates. So now he knows the coordinates where the last part of the movie is going to happen, apparently. <laughs> okay, you're joking, but that's literally what the coordinates No, it is, are. it is. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, and, and so Diana's trying to call Nick and say, hey, I kidnapped your kid, but I did it with the best of intentions. But of course, the phones are out because there's so many problems with all the electromagnetism. Don't worry, they won't be when the plot needs them to not be later. <laughs> That's true. So yeah, 
But so she hangs up and she's talking to the kids and she's like, you know, so are you guys still hearing creepy whisper demons? And they're like, yeah. And she literally asks, how did the whisper people talk to you? And, and I'm like, they, they fucking whisper. How are they, they going to, how are they going to tell you that without you sounding like an idiot? Like you set <laughs> them up to make you feel bad. <laughs> anyway, so they stop at a gas station. They've got to gas up, but before she can pay, the big emergency broadcast announcement comes up and says, you're all going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. yeah. It seems like a, <laughs> seems like a bad plan. There's a general, like the, the <laughs> joint chiefs of staff, one of those guys. And he's on the news being like, okay, everybody, you should start panicking now, I would say. <laughs> yeah. That would be. The they they might move. as well have a countdown to when you should start panicking on the screen. Like three, <laughs> two, one, panic. Okay. But he says, you know, the best advice that we can offer the public is to save your own. That feels really irresponsible. Like, yeah, so the official line of the US government is the purge. Yeah. Have at it. <laughs> Murder panic. <laughs> yeah. I love that this moment he says, like, okay, start panicking now on the TV. And we watch one guy in the convenience store inside the gas station, and he's holding a small bag of chips. And you watch him think about his purchase. And he's like, hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna get the bigger bag. I'm gonna get the bigger bag. <laughs> Might as well. It's apocalypse. And, and just be clear, this is another IMD trivia point. The bag of chips that he's all, that he's holding is an exclusively Australian brand of chips. Oh, because nice. The entire the entire uh, uh, oh. gas uh, station is filled with Australian <laughs> products. Well, this is so fucking stupid. So for the rest of the this this will apparently for the next forty five minutes or so, you know, to demonstrate that the world is in chaos. Now people will just be randomly running in different directions in this parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> right as though like as like when you accidentally kick over an ant hill right it's that kind of flurry of activity and we have to assume everywhere on earth yeah right now it's the apocalypse i'm doing serpentine i'm not sure what <laughs> <laughs> what would you need from the gas station to die tomorrow <laughs> I mean, bag of, big bag of chips obviously but yeah, yeah you go for other that. than other than that I grab a chips <laughs> so so, okay, so now the phones are going to work again because the plot requires that. So Caleb goes to the payphone and calls his dad's cell phone, right? He had a quarter on him, mm -hmm. <laughs> Caleb. Yeah, you know, you always want to... It, it would have it been great if we'd had to go through the 1-800-COLLECT thing at that point or something, but no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he calls him and he's like, hey, dad, I'm at a gas station. And he's like, which gas station? And he's like, yeah, I guess without that information, it's in Australia. So really, you're not... <laughs> it's, it's a long drive. <laughs> there's no way you're going to make it in time. But just then, Diana comes by and she picks up the phone and she's like, hey, I was trying to call you about the kidnapping earlier. Phones didn't work. Now they do. So, so weird. You would have thought that announcing that the world was going to end would have made it harder to get through, not easier. But apparently it, this, in this universe, who the fuck knows? Well, may maybe a lot of people just thought, thought, well, there's no point having this phone conversation. I can, I can hang this conversation up right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm right, not right. I'm, my time in phone conversations. I'm going to go get some fucking chips. Yeah. I'm going to run to the gas station one more time before this is all over. Yeah. So, but Nick says, hey, but I found those coordinates. It turns out it was your mom's trailer. <laughs> that old trailer in the woods that we went to, that's where the end of this movie is going to happen. And she's like, well, that doesn't make any fucking sense at all. He's like, right? Yeah, but he said, no, it does make sense because since we were starting to try and survive the apocalypse here, we've been to the school, MIT, and my house. So there's only one other location in this film. <laughs> oh, that's so true. So we have to use that one. <laughs> yep. Well, that and the gas station, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And just then, she notices a mysterious pebble on top of the payphone that she's talking on. God damn it. I, I was so <laughs> mad by this point because I was like, I know they're not going to have these rocks pay off. I know it's going to be fucking nope. nothing. It's so weird. And just as she notices that, creepy whisper guy steals his her car with the kids in it and drives off. Who leaves their keys in the car while they're getting gas? With their kids in it. And their kids, but you're asking for your car to get, I mean, forget the kids. You're asking for your car to get stolen if you leave the keys in the car. Right. It's panicky chaos in there. Yeah. And also, like, this negates the entire movie. Right? Like, so the whisper guys were going to kidnap the kids and take them to that point. <laughs> Why did anyone have to have these coordinates? If you think about it, Nick Cage, knowing the coordinates made it harder for them to kidnap the kids and take him to this trailer. He wouldn't even know about that trailer if it hadn't been for the fucking number list. Oh, it all makes sense now. Because they had to wait 50 years to just grab these kids and go. 
that's really boring. So they were like, look, it's going to be way too easy. We're here for all this time. How about we spice it up a little bit? You know, we throw a few obstacles in there. There's this physicist who is really bad at his job. I reckon we can rope him into this. <laughs> so, Lucinda in 1959 being like this, you're making this so much harder than it has to be. You're going to have to wait around for 50 years. You're going to get bored. So, you're probably going to add stupid stuff. Do you want to just... I don't know. Take me. You guys are going to be like using rocks and stuff later. Yeah, right, right. No, it's, it's fine. It's fine. We'll wait until you have a child and then they have a child and then, you know, we'll just fuck with that kid. It's fine. What? It's fine. What? It'll all make sense. Just me right now. I'm already, I'm a child right now. You could take me to do whatever <laughs> that's, alien that's thing. That's the thing, right? Because they're eventually going to take a bunch of kids to repopulate you know, some mm. other planet. So, like, you don't have to wait until the day before the apocalypse to do the, is this like homework that you were putting off or something? Oh man, that is, that is absolutely soul crushing for Lucinda. Cause she's like, okay, so you're, you're taking kids off to another planet in order for the human race to survive. And you're communicating with the kids mm -hmm. that yeah. you want to, uh, to, to survive. So, um, when are we going? <laughs> oh, oh. No. sorry, not oh, you. I oh, definitely right. not you. Gross. Started. No, we have a 50 year plan to All get right. around you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you were any good, we'd be leaving right now, but we've got to wait 50 years. That's how rubbish a person you are. Well, yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe they were planning, and, and then Lucinda was just so annoying. They're like, she keeps staring into the fucking sun and shit and scratching <laughs> shit with her fingers where she could just write it on the desk. I don't, I don't know, man. Let's just, let's, let's do, let's do the long con. Yeah. So, all right. So mom goes to chase the kids. She just steals some other dude's car and goes to chase the kids and gets into a Fatal car accident for reasons that will not move the plot forward in any meaningful way. <laughs> okay. No, no, not in the slightest. It was pretty funny though. It was when the eighteen wheeler hit her. Oh out yeah, nowhere. it would have been. I also thought like as soon as she stole the car to chase after the whisper people with the kids, I was like, okay, it's pretty funny if no apocalypse happens and it's just like the next day she gets arrested for stealing the car. <laughs> the end. And for kidnapping children. Yeah. Oh, kidnapping one right? Kid, yeah. yeah. Nick Cage shows up and he's like, hey, good news, I managed to stop the apocalypse. Oh. This is going to be awkward now. <laughs> yeah, because then yes. her alibi is that I met a random physicist who turned up and uh, spoke to me in a museum about some numbers my mum had written 50 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> not, not guilty, Your Honor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was chasing after different kidnappers that they whisper to kill. Mm, okay, I'm guilty. I was trying to unkidnap the kids. Unkidnap them. <laughs> so if you double kidnap it, it, it cancels it out. <laughs> So, okay. So Nick Cage, now luckily, despite all of the chaos and parking lot running that's going on to the gas station, there's no real traffic. So Nick Cage gets to the gas station without incident. And he asks the cashier, he's like, hey, did you see a lady with a kid? And he's like, I did. I did see exactly one lady with a kid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, <laughs> this gas station guy had excellent attention to detail during the <laughs> literal looting riot that yes. is happening around. People are running Incredible. serpentine and killing each other for potato chips. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, no, she took a Dodge. Uh, I, the license plate Durango. was AXB. <laughs> yeah. I, I also love that they that he says, so which way did she go? And he goes, that way. Oh, you mean the only other direction from yes. the one that I came in on this right. road? Got it. Don't yes. stop at the gas station then. <laughs> right, exactly. Is she where I came from? No. Then she's the other way. Yep. Okay. It's, it's one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> she went toward the future temporarily. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we, he, he, he takes off in that direction, comes across the ambulance, has a, a moment with her corpse, and he's like, wow, seems like I thought you were going to be the love interest, and really, you didn't serve any purpose in the film at all except for to have a female lead really if yeah. you think what you didn't do anything meaningful at any point and he sort of holds a hand and he's like i'm sorry and i just want him to carry on like i'm sorry but you know this was kind of on you this whole death <laughs> <laughs> you've just, got a big part to play in this stuck around with my door or if you just followed normal traffic safety rules and regulations mm. post apocalypse all, all, all of this would have saved you. Yeah. your car with gas earlier. If you just if you just started with a full tank, you'd still be alive now. There you go. <laughs> so okay. So now he's going to drive out to the creepy trailer. Why? What is he going to do? What does he think because at this moment he's going to do there? That's where the coordinates tell him to go. Which honestly, I mean, he's got nowhere else to go. You might as well. <laughs> well, but here's the thing though is that like up until now the coordinates have been the place where the disaster hit. So they're like <laughs> the one place that you least want to be, right? Yeah. Though these coordinates are a place to stay away from. 
But no, no. In this in, in this instance, they're the place that you're supposed to go. So he drives out there. This is where, though, we get the rock payoff. It turns out that those same type of rocks are near that trailer. Yeah. That's it, though. That's it. It's just, it. There were some there, too. So the Whisper people were just, like, grabbing a couple each time they went there during their plot. And then, like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to put this right here on top of this phone. It's going to be sweet. Oh. They're not going to know what it is. <laughs> it's going to be like our calling card. I figured this out as well. They didn't pick up those pebbles each time. They've been waiting for 50 years for this moment to happen. They've been doubting the purpose of their existence, and they've got their pockets filled with stones. That's what's happened here. And it's only when these kids came along, they were like, okay, we'll see how oh, these kids now. play out. I mean, we've always got tomorrow. The plan is still there. We've still got a plan tomorrow, but we'll see how this plans out. So, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, so he comes across all the mysterious wrecks. He finds Diana's stolen car, and then he sees creepy next to the woods guy standing there. Right. And he's like, hey, man, I, I, you, I have halogen lamps. That's going to equal out to your mouth light. So let's not do that again. Right. And like, these guys are going to be the, we, we immediately found out that actually these guys are the good guys. Yes. But if these are the good guys, everything they have done has done themselves no favors at all. All of their demeanor is not doing them any favors. <laughs> no. Terrible. No. Nick Cage walks up to the one with his gun and he's like, hey, you know, I've got Chekhov's gun right here in my hand. We're almost to the end of the movie and it hasn't been fired yet. You better answer me. And he doesn't answer because he can't talk. He can only do brain whispers. But luckily, just then Caleb shows up and he's like, hey, don't shoot him. He's a good guy, it turns out. It's these are supposed to be alien like angels, right? Mm. They're or aliens working with angels and God. They're, they are angels. Yeah, we're going to find out in a minute. Yeah. God has his angel people dress up like Columbine and like do <laughs> whisper based pedophile seeming stuff. Like what the fuck? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So Caleb comes up and he's like, hey, don't shoot them. They're the good guys. Him and all his buddies line up like a fucking album cover or something. And they're like, see, good guys. <laughs> also, it's, uh, Caleb has a bunny now. Yeah. He's like, I figured we would give the kid a sidekick at this point. What? Why? Easter rabbit rebirth phoenix full circle. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Cadbury eggs are delicious. <laughs> That is that is ha the only way we can justify that this film is a, is, a, is a religious film. Even though at this moment, the kid says, the whisper people told me that mommy is safe now in heaven. Yes. But you're right. It's the, the bunny is the sign that this is a religious film. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> uh, or, or the fucking Ezekiel sp spaceship yes. that's suddenly yeah. now coming down from the, from the heavens. <laughs> oh, the fucking angel aliens with an Ezekiel spaceship. Yes. Amazing. So yeah. stupid. My, my notes do say at this point, you guys are so, so, so welcome for this one. Because <laughs> then Nicholas, Nicholas Cage sees the spaceship and in awe, he drops to his knees as if in prayer. Yes. Just really labeling his own He's thing. He's like, oh, Christianity was right all along. Ezekiel spaceship. Yeah. So apparently what we get from this is that God is knowing the world again. Yeah. And he has chosen Caleb and this little girl as the reboot couple. <laughs> right these two 11 year olds or whatever yeah and this is a really bad plan like why would you take them <laughs> yes it is this you know, we'll find out in a moment that it's not just those because i was thinking this is this is very silly you've got two like eight-year-olds or something you're gonna need other kids you're not gonna have a viable breeding population no. with just two no so i i then looked up what a viable breeding population is for the human race so they'd have to be taking at least 4169 eight-year-olds and then leaving them for a decade or so to have a, a minimal viable breeding population. Well, right. Or, or you could get them a little older. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like you would start with grab a bunch of like 17 year olds now when you've got a good 20 years of breeding in them. There. Oh, so yes. They could really get a head start on this whole thing. <laughs> so, but they're not taking the old ones because we find out that Nickel kids are okay. Cool. We'll, we'll, we'll just get on this spaceship now then. Sorry, uh, sorry, n not me. Okay, oh yeah, okay. right. That's the whisper the guys best. have to be like, oh, so yeah. So we went through this same thing with Lucinda once before. We're a little better at it now, but uh, <laughs> no, yeah. you're not. You overact. That's the problem. We don't yeah. want. If you, could you imagine being on a spaceship with you for like the ten years it's going to take us to get to this other planet? I mean, come on. It's it's very much a step forward. All those who are getting on the spaceship, Nick. Not, 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 not so fast. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How we're breaking this team. And Abby at this point does not care 
because she's like, ah, it's fine. I've traded my lame mom in for like two totally sweet bunnies. Right. I've come out, come out up on this, uh, this exchange. Right. Her fucking mom died earlier that evening. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, Lou, 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 got some bunnies. <laughs> right. <laughs> So the kid is all sad. He's like, oh, but now, dad, you're going to die. And he's like, it's okay, because I have a locket for you. (laughs) I love that this kind of ends with what they're saying is the good guys, this angel alien being like the bouncer at a restricted country club being like, no, no No Jewish people are atheists or whatever that guy is. No, right. 100%. Well, but he's not an atheist, right? Because he stops and he says, I know now that your mom is in heaven and she's doing just fine. And I'm like, why do you know that? Why do aliens You couldn't possibly know that. That's so stupid. I've literally written down, Nicolas Cage realized that heaven is real because aliens are abducting his kid. Yes. (laughs) But like, if heaven is real, just let his son stay and die so right. they'll all be reunited. Sure. Because yeah. you've got, it's right in front of you now. I wanted the alien to be like, oh, okay, yeah, technically you did accept Jesus now, Nick Cage. Okay, so our plan is to have your child fuck this girl. Uh, you're going to be on the <laughs> ship at this point. I don't think. <laughs> it's going to yeah. mm. get very weird. There's a lovely line from Cage as well, because he says to his son when he realizes, he says, I'm not leaving you. And like, Technically, that's true. The kid is leaving you. Well, you're right, staying. right. You're not, no, you're not going saying. anywhere. Well, the earth is moving very quickly, <laughs> if you think about it. He is going <laughs> to, once they take off. But yeah, so, and, and then this is where we see the Whisper People's true forms, right? They like oh. shed their fucking Lost Boys outfits and their see through humanoids with like ephemeral angel wings. Yeah. And they've got a very strong meme from a David Icke book look to their, yes, uh, to their, don't their they. general uh, <laughs> general bodies. Don't they? Yeah, so they fly up in their spaceship. The spaceship leaves. Somehow there are still seven minutes in this fucking movie. <laughs> don't worry, six of them will be the Earth exploding. Oh, oh, and all the weird rocks float as the spaceship takes off. Well, yeah, yeah. Some of them, a little bit. Some <laughs> like, of them, not all of them. A few of them levitate like Two feet. Yeah, they all start to and float. then drop back down. And then end of rocks. That's the end of the rocks. <laughs> yeah. No, I've, I've got I've got nothing. I have no <laughs> idea what they've got. Absolutely. Why would the rest nothing. of everything else? Yeah. So yeah, but but this is what we see that they have several spaceships. So Nick Cage's kid wasn't that special after all. There's a lot of lot of kids here in the Whisper People and potentially a breeding uh, population. Okay. Why why does the alien re- why do they need humans in the universe? Why why do humans have to still be a thing? Because why are we, we're, we are made in God's image, Heath. So are the aliens. Well, that's true. They're angels though. They're they're not they, they don't have free will. But just get any I feel like humans are bad. You you would feel like God could just make new humans since he made those there other ones go. out of dust and ribs to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So okay. So then Nick Cage lays down on the rocks and goes to sleep. Yeah, which could be for anything up to 15 hours, apparently. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, we have no idea. So honestly, Nick Cage waking up in ever weirder places is a big theme of this movie, right? Because then we mm. cut to, like, it's raining and he wakes up and he's like, oh, this is a shit place to sleep. You'd think <laughs> this is my last sleep. I'd want to do it somewhere comfortable. And he's like, oh, you know what? I should drive to see my estranged dad, who apparently lives in Manhattan. Hope there's no traffic in Manhattan. <laughs> oh, no, he goes to Boston here. Oh, is it Boston that he goes to? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. All he right. drives, to, he drives yes. through, like, through parts of Boston and f- eventually finds his parents' house. Yeah. Oh, well, then it makes sense that there was no traffic. Okay, never mind. Yeah, yeah. He, he does an excellent job of driving very calmly through complete carnage <laughs> yes. as civilization crumbles around him and there's just open riots, but not in the little stretch of road that he happens to be <laughs> using at that time. Right. They're like, well, we got to make room for the protagonist here. And he drives past his friend, Phil. Oh, does he really? Yeah. Yeah. He sees his friend Phil and Phil's wife in the, in the, just on the side of it. And ima- <laughs> as if you do, like, I imagine Boston's a fairly large, popular, well, well popular city. As if yeah, you're going to see your fucking friend. <laughs> and they, they make eye contact. Yeah. He's just, he's driving oh, through a riot in the middle of Boston and he looks over and he sees Phil and he's like, Hey, Phil, just, just driving through the riot, you know, like yeah. you do. And how's it going? There's a very kind of, what are you going to do? Look to his face. Like, yeah. oh, what, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> and the direction for Phil was just like, stand there in atheist sorrow. You can't react to this. So <laughs> Phil just like kind of weeps and hugs his wife and does nothing and doesn't move. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, so he eventually he drives to his parents' house. 
apparently dad is a billionaire pastor based on the home that he owns in the middle of Boston. <laughs> but dad is very proud of Nick Cage for facing this rapture like a man, you know, uh, not hiding in some damn cave somewhere. Yeah. And then they have a big family hug. And the earth explodes. <laughs> yeah. His sister's at the house. Grace is there. And mm-hmm. he's like, oh, Caleb's safe. He's he's with aliens doing maybe a sex experiment. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but safe. And then we watch Boston get vaporized by the sun, which was uh, kind of a cool shot, actually. Sure, yeah. But what do they think a solar flare is? Right? <laughs> like, I'm so, I'm so curious why... Mm. Oh, but yeah, okay. And and then we we watched the whole earth explode for like, you know, five, six fucking minutes. And then we cut way back off to like where we're seeing it from like, you know, whatever, Mars or something. And we can see these big like chunks flying off the side <laughs> of earth. Now, give it these would be the size of like mountains, given mm. how far away we are. But they're like, oh, you know, that's probably like the... The, the dust and stuff would get ripped away, right? Probably. Well, the mountains are, are very loosely held to the surface of the Earth <laughs> by mostly atmosphere and electromagnetic radiation. Right. They're, they're, they're massive magnets. They're just massive, massive magnets. Well, that's true. Yeah, you reverse yeah. the polarity of them and they'll go the other way. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. So, yeah, so the mountains fly off. Meanwhile, Abby and Caleb get dropped off on an alien heaven world. <laughs> There's a massive cornfield. Yeah. yeah. They got some nice linen cult outfits. Yes, yes. They're dressed all in white. To wear while they, I guess, fuck in these amber waves of grain where they've been delivered. And that's the end. Well, there's, there's a giant tree. I, I was shocked that the tree didn't have apples on it or whatever. And the kids didn't change. Like, I, I, I'm surprised that there wasn't a hello, my name is Adam and my name is Eve thing at the end of this. <laughs> Absolutely. So fucking stupid. But yeah, they run towards the... Tree of the knowledge of Schmud and Schmeevil or whatever. <laughs> and we get some triumphal music and the whole thing ends. So I I, I feel like that's the dumbest possible ending. I'd, I'd be happy to be proven wrong, though. Can you guys think of a dumber <laughs> possible ending for this? So I, I, I think I've got a better ending. Okay. okay. So Nicolas Cage goes to his family, hugs his pastor dad, closes his eyes and waits for the solar flare to hit. And nothing happens. And then we cut up to the alien spacecraft and they're all celebrating, pulling off basically an Ocean's Eleven style heist to steal a shitload of kids from us. So the, the rule said you had to have dad's permission or whatever when you yeah, say, exactly. yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Okay. Dumber ending. That's just fantastic. That's yeah. what should have absolutely happened. I get, okay, dumber ending, same thing. We see the shot, but the shot of Earth getting vaporized by the sun is, it's a flat Earth. It's actually flat. <laughs> <laughs> Make it even more gam appropriate. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, I guess that's going to do it for our review of Knowing, but that's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to bring him back next week. So, Heath, tell us, what's on deck? The Lion of Judah. Oh, something tells me that's not going to sneak its Christianity in quite to the same degree. As <laughs> I believe one. it's fairly overt in its Christianity, and I believe it's animated. Oh, awesome. Awesome. All right. Lion cartoons. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So with a cartoon to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 356 to a merciful close. Obviously, I need to thank Marsh again for helping us out this week, and I need to remind you to check the show notes for links to all his stuff. I also want to offer an even bigger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. If you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Alias, Citation Data, d d Minus, and The Skeptocrat, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email God at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robertson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. All of the music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm an illusions promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. 4,169 eight-year-olds went on to starve to death on an alien corn planet. <laughs> right, because it was wheat. What, are you just going to eat handfuls of wheat? <clears throat> I'm actually gluten intolerant. This is not good. And they're kids. Yep. <laughs> In this movie's timeline, Donald Trump went on to not be president. So it wasn't all bad. So something <laughs> burning the wire. And God 
went on to redo the sun. It was a whole thing. A big pain in the ass. <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. At University of Phoenix, we know you've had a master's degree on your mind. But did you know that your experience can help you earn a competency-based master's in less than a year for under $11,000? Stop thinking and start doing. Learn more at phoenix.edu. When you think of first energy, you probably think about the men and women who keep the lights on. What you might not know is that they're also lighting the way in our community see their stories at firstenergycorp.com slash light the way